Well, the icon is gone and the icon is back. This one is the all new Land Rover Defender. We'll take you on an in-depth tour on the exterior and the interior. Different trims for you today. And of course, it's still available in two different lengths. So let's join us here on Autogefühl. Full HD, full screen and full length. As always, let's go. Land Rover or Range Rover models nowadays all somewhat look the same in the front especially, but that's not the case for the Defender. The Defender got an own unique look, reminding us a little bit of those angular lines, not as angular as it used to be, yes, so we have some round shapes right there, but definitely still with an own front face. Also with those round headlamps right there, and here in the silver paint we also show you different paints very soon in a big Defender batching there in the front. Interesting also on top of the hood that we have, you know, those um, off-road rem rem uh, reminiscence. It's really interesting here in the black cladding. So this car does have some emotional features and that's also why people buy it. You can still get the 90 and the 110. This one, of course, obviously the 110, the five-door version, but it does not correspond to the overall wheelbase. Here, length is 4 meters 75 or 187 inches. That means it's a wheelbase of 3 meters and 2 or 119 inches and the biggest techno technology change is there's no rigid axle in the rear anymore you have both independent suspension this will give you more comfort will also mean less off-roadish but yeah i mean nowadays you can build also good off-road cars with independent suspension i think that's that's key 3.5 tons for the towing capacity and you can see here in the side profile this again the five door version pretty much upright this typical angular Land Rover Defender design, so it also is a little bit different than again to the other Land Rover or Range Rover models. Then also those typical styling elements, so they try to keep some quotes from the past vehicles. You can also get 18 inch steel wheels if you want an off-road character. Those ones are the biggest 22 inch aluminum wheels if you want a more you know menacing street look, so to say. Contrast clangs in the lower end, also angular door hands that fits to the car very well. And then you also get this you know, retro styling element right there. If it makes sense, yes or no, I mean, that's probably another question. Um, but at least it adds some uniqueness to the car. Also the small design elements right there, we have this cut in in those crossover wheel arches. So we'll soon also show the three door version to you. This one, the five door so far, what do you think about the design? And let me give you some off-road figures. Approaching angle in the front, 38 degrees maximum. Descending angle in the rear, 40 degrees, but that rather accounts for the three-door version. 90 centimeters of wading depth, and here you can still get the big replacement tire here at the back of the car. Other than that, it's also very distinctive as for the rear design. For example, here with those squircle design elements here in the rear as for the lamps. And of course, this door here will still open in this very distinctive way because the rear tire would be just too heavy to flip it open. Soon more about the interior. This one, by the way, is also the first edition, a special launch edition model with some design elements. But you can individualize this car so much yeah, but the price, it will at least start at 50k and you can easily get it, you know, rather to 90 or something. So this is also something that has been lost over time. So this is a super expensive vehicle now. So as for engines, the good thing is, whereas all the other manufacturers use strange nomenclature to hide their engine format, here you can really rely on the horsepower figures. So what we have here, we have P half, we have also petrol and diesel. So there's a P300, that's also the horsepower figure for the petrol, a P400E with a mild hybrid, six cylinder. Then there's the P400E with the P half, so the plug-in hybrid, and then diesel a D200 and D240. And again, those are also the horsepower figures, so pretty easy to remember in this case.
now to the interior. Right there, inside of the doors, we start right there. So soft touch materials right there. And here some screws visible. And there's also this off-road design element. So pretty fancy, definitely. Not too big, those inside door pockets. And then this one is a special bright interior. This has a unique styling. Um, I mean, it's like fixed plastic, but that also adds some rugged character to the car. Then again, those leather red covers right here and there. Open boxes also again to remind of the old model and more visible screws. So definitely a different style than we know from other Land Rover or Range Rover models. Also some fabric inserts at those seats. Um, not sure if it's leather red or animal skin here. I don't have the overview of all the seating materials available yet, but there will of course be different one available in the bright color. It fits the car very well actually. At least if you can then live with some stains later on. So this interior does have something which reminds us of the other models, but still has enough uniqueness to be an own Defender style. Getting inside, here this typical upright seating position. When sitting here, yeah, it is somewhat similar than if you would enter a Land Rover Discovery. Um, but that's not a bad thing, definitely. You, again, this command driving position, pretty long hood, so... Um, but what is good is that you all have those upright windows and so you still have somewhat a good all-around view. Interior overview here with this horizontal stress and a lot of cubby holes right there. The screen here is in demo mode, so we will see um, different stuff that can be displayed at the moment actually. Then the steering wheel can be moved up and down electronically and also a little bit inward and outward again. All digital instruments, they are in the middle part and you can see when they're shut off Everything is just black or dark. Let's see if we can turn the demo mode right on again. Um, those ones here are not visible buttons, so to say. Um, they have clicking sound. There will be also buttons here for the cruise control. This will be illuminated then when the car is properly powered on. On the left side then, for example, for the volume control. Some of the materials I'm not quite certain of. So um, it's a very expensive vehicle and from some build quality stuff, I would expect then a little bit more. There we have demo mode again here for this camera, especially for the off-road camera, all around view. Then you also can see the inclination and so on. This will be pretty cool. Also, for example, not sure if they show the weight sensing mode as well. So there you can pick the off-road modes when you are in this off-road gear selector, which will be probably placed here, I guess. Always nice to follow those demo modes. I mean, I don't have to click it myself. Of course, I would prefer clicking it myself. But in this case, it's also nice to have a showcase sample. It will be working via touch. And I mean, to access it, yeah, it's a little bit blocking here with the gear shifting lever, which is integrated in the console. Apple CarPlay is also available. Finally, now they don't go their own way anymore. As for that, there will also be a GPS sample quite soon. So a lot of things you can control here. Weather apps, for example. Yeah, I mean, it looks like English weather, doesn't it? <laughs> but I mean, the weather is not too different from the ones we have in, in Germany usually, so I can't complain. There we get a showcase of the 360 degree camera. If that is the real resolution, then it looks indeed pretty amazing, very interesting. We wait for some more stuff to come. There's the Land Rover logo. Um, there's also the Apple CarPlay. Um, good morning, Elizabeth. No, that's maybe the Queen, Alex. This again, the home screen. Then you can have the GPS or the phone right there. Ah, there's the GPS. So they also have this 3D animation then with those buildings. Of course, when we test drive the car, we'll see how that one plays out. There we go. Now I would like to see how the Apple CarPlay is integrated. I think we'll get very soon to that. Um, the layout here is actually quite clean, you know, how it stands here between those two horizontal bars. I really like that. Um, and the top part of the dashboard, by the way, is also from soft touch. So that's actually pretty cool. Other than that, um, I guess this one will be the climate unit on the right side. So probably the one for off-roading and then down here, climate unit control. And they kept this area also pretty clean. So most of the stuff has actually gone into the GPS. And that's the way you can also then pick a new destination so and while we wait for the carplay to show up maybe we can zoom a little bit out again because then i can already show you that in the 
lower part. We have USB-C device and normal USB-C device and a nano SIM. So for your smartphone to connect it then with the mirroring function. And there's another 12 volt power supply as well. And then below that, it's hard to see, but there's you know a lot of storage space from the side or from, from above. You can reach that all. Then you have those adaptive cup holders. They are cladded with those rubber pads. And then, you know, the materials here, they are a little bit weak then again. So we have light and shadow in the interior. This one is pretty well attached. This very big armrest right there. And underneath we have serious storage space together also with the cooling function for this pad here. And in the front of that, as we see the simple, there's also an inductive charging pad available for your smartphone. But when you connect it with the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto via cable, then of course it makes somewhat more sense to, you know, just have it with the cable connection and then maybe put it here in the lower part where there's, where there's this very big cubby hole in the front. So a very refreshing interior, definitely to see a difference to the one we see in the other Land Rovers or Range Rovers. So overall, I think, very reusable. And of course, you know, all those square dimensions, you feel that you have the space here in the front. Now to the biggest advantage of the 5 door version. Yeah, of course, you can easily access the rear compartment. Again, the visible screw design element. Same as in the front, we also have those soft touch materials at the rear doors on the inside. And then some reasonable space here for the rear bench, because everything is built in an upright character. So you don't lose too much length, also as for the legroom and so on. Let's also test that. It's getting side right here. And there's ample of space and probably also the best package for the Land Rover or Range Rover cars because it's not the longest Land Rover or Range Rover we have here, but truly one with the most legroom. So I really like that approach. Um, see here the lower floor raises just a little bit. Then you can add an infotainment system right there, or there's also USB supply. And it's really cozy to sit here in the interior, also in a very upright way. Headroom is also plentiful with one with A6 or 6 with one. And then since this car is standing so high, there's also no significant middle tunnel in the rear. So it just raises just a little bit here, so it can easily also sit in the middle seat here. Very comfortable to travel with four Actually, in this case, with five tall adults, some charging device in the lower part, 12 volt power supply, USB both two times. Seat heating optional available also for the rear seating area. Then you have some adaptive cup holders with some rubber pads right there. And you can already flip the seats from here. Oh, and by the way, like this, you can put the lower part of the rear bench down first. Then you should actually remove the head restraints or pull them all the way in at least. Let's see, well, there's an interesting cladding here on the back part. Also a nice retro style. So let's see about those head restraints first. It's because they can be flipped for that. Like this, and like this. Then we can try again. Yeah, that's an easier solution definitely than taking them out. So, and then it actually does fit and also they hide behind that one. Then you have a very even loading area. So that's pretty cool. This is really interesting. This part here, the inside of the rear doors will flash when someone is approaching from the rear. It's like a blind spot monitor for the inside of the rear doors that warns you when, or before getting out. And another unique feature, if you look from the inside to the, let's say, side ceiling, so between the rear compartment and the trunk, you have those skylight views, those very small additional windows in the ceiling. Pretty amazing. Then let's open this rear hatch. Here we go with this side opening. Pretty fancy. And wow, a lot of space, square dimensions. And with a nice floor cover, we already flipped the one side. Of course, you can do the very same with the other one. And pretty rugged ground here. Yeah, I mean, it might be prone to scratches, yes, but I cannot get that up myself at the moment, just like that. So, very interesting area right here. Some storage right there. And also, of course, you can use it all the way up to the total height of that car. So, this looks really practical, pretty amazing. Then, since you also can get an air suspension here, you can lower the car to load things out easier as possible. And there also to retract the towing bar. Outside you can see the car's 
definitely better. But we also want to show you what's going inside the booth here at Land Rover because we have some more color variations here. The shots won't be as clear just on this one here because this one is here on this floating water uh, platform. <laughs> Pretty funny, definitely. Three door in this light green color. But there are other colors exterior and interior available. Of course, we'll be getting a little bit crowded right here, but they can also for example, see this golden paint. This is a very interesting, unique paint. Not sure how many people will go for that, but just to show you that right here. This one also with a darker or black interior. You can see here again the visible screws, but then on the outside car we had the bright one, this one here then with the all black interior. And it also has a black painted front hood. But I think the contrast then, you know, to the checkered metal elements here is not that big then when you have this black hood right there. Then there are more five-door versions on display. For example here you can see on the top part there this is the one with a side ladder we know that from the old car and also with a top roof cover and you can put some 300 kilograms then on the top of the roof for real or more off-road usage silver paint then with a contrasting 110 hood sticker there we go so which color is your favorite here for today for the defender something you need when you only know from the jeep wrangler at the moment for example that you have those you know three door short cars short suvs and i mean why not so if you don't need you know five people in the car you can also drive a shorter car and I think it looks actually quite decent also in this short wheelbase version. What, what's your take on that? So why not, you know? So now, this one there. Ah, oh, it's close up at the moment. So we'd like to see the trunk, but you can see from the inside here, it's just like very short. And then you have the rear seats which you can fold. So you'll primarily lose the trunk. And of course, I mean, you have to go right in here let's see there it is of course limited then in the legroom you can still sit in the rear yes but of course limited in the legroom and then you either have a possibility to sit or you have some trunk left rear interesting this one is also the jump seat you know like in an airplane so with a three-seater setup in the front and I like those, you know, those joyful details also with a contrasting steering wheel. Well, with this five-door off-road display of the all-new Land Rover Defender, we end our today's review of this one here. Interesting, they kept a very iconic style also on the exterior. It's of course totally different from the outgoing model, yes, but it has an own distinctive style also if you compare other Land Rover or Range Rover models from the lineup. So I think it's a really interesting car and Maybe a new competitor to the Mercedes G-Class, for example. And the Jeep Wrangler is, of course, also a unique one. So very rare and unique cars there on the market. The good thing is, because of this angular design on the exterior, we have a lot of space on the interior. The best package from all Land Rover cars. That's pretty cool. So you can use a lot of the space you have. Then there are also, for example, those new PHEV engines available if you want to go a little bit more sustainable. Sustainable materials, we have to see about that. Of course, abundance of cow leather use here on the display cars. The quality of the interior materials is sometimes very good. So if I like those visible screws, those are cool elements, all those rugged elements. On the other hand, there are some parts which are, you know, not living up to the price of the car, which is extremely high, 50 to 90k. And that's, of course, my biggest criticism, criticism point with the car. Yeah, the G car is also very expensive, but from, you know, this rather off-roadish car, I would also expect to be, you know, a little bit cheaper than a little bit more affordable. Off-road use will be also quite cool, so it will still be also among the most capable Land Rover vehicles. Also, if you think about approaching engines, and not only the five-door, especially about the three-door. So, a lot to discuss with this vehicle. Please join us there in the comments. I hope you enjoyed also this part here. It's time for the all-electric Porsche Taycan in the series production model here on Autogefuel, and obviously also time for Thomas Blue. A tour on exterior, interior, and the technology features is here on Autogefuel, your number one resource for in-depth car reviews and your number one community to discuss cars. Today with Thomas, and of course, everything in full HD, full screen, and full length. Let's go.
in the front of the all electric Porsche Taycan we can see it does not look that much electric you know there are a lot of electric vehicles which try to look normal so to say and then there are other ones that say like hello I'm an electric vehicle and this one is rather something where you say yeah it's a little bit different than for example the Porsche Panamera which would come closest to it size wise in their model lineup but definitely not screaming out EV. So more a normal Porsche style. And it looks a little bit sleeker definitely in the front than the Panamera. Also some 911 jeans, yes. And also some air intakes in the lower part. And yes, EVs do need some cooling, especially for example, for the thermal management of the battery. Then we can see here LED is standard for the headlamps. And then we also have this four dot design for the daytime running lights and matrix LED is optional this blue by the way is called gentian blue in german it would be encian so yeah that's a flower which also has you know well similar color but definitely a very lovely color we call thomas blue here on auto Fuel always when there's you know a very interesting blue color because that's my favorite as for the car as for the exterior of course more to come from this car here all around it 4 meters 96, 16 foot 3 or 195 inches is the length of the Porsche Taycan and that means it's about 9 centimeters or 3.5 inches shorter than the Porsche Panamera. So yes, they somehow come close. The Panamera is also available as a plug-in hybrid vehicle but this one here of course the pure electric one. Just a battery here then in the lower area to keep the weight very low and the center of gravity as well. This promises at least a lot of agile driving fun, although the weight is of course way higher than with the Panamera. There's one motor per axle, for example, as you also know from a Tesla Model S, but special here is that the rear motor will get a two-speed transmission. Usually EVs have you know just one gear, here actually two gears in the rear, for more efficiency also at higher speeds because this one can go high speed soon more to the technical details. First of all, something about the design. You can see here very muscular front shoulder, so to say. This one here then is the charging possibility. AC charging will work on both sides. DC on the left-hand drive car here, DC on the other side. And if you have the UK vehicle, DC will be on this side. You slide it here again and it goes back, very interesting. 20 inch wheels here, different sizes will be available. This one has also some aerodynamic style, a little bit more covered. And then very, very sleek design. So indeed, not sure how it, uh, you know, how you can, can conceive it on camera, but when I'm here now live in the studio, this car looks smaller, looks sleeker than it actually is. So it does not look like a car that would be almost five meters long. It looks smaller from the exterior. Very strong shoulders here, typical Porsche and this Coupe line. It does have some similarities with the Panamera, but indeed it looks way smaller than the Panamera. That's, you know, the surprise to me. We know it from the 911, those integrated door handles, which are more aerodynamic as well. And, you know, just from the handling, we can talk about that. We'll talk about more about that definitely when we soon open the door. So, and what else is already to say, let me talk about the suspension because we got a three chamber air suspension as standard on this vehicle. And you already seen on the front, this one here is the Porsche Taycan Turbo. There will first be a turbo and the Turbo S, so the top models for the launch. Later on, there will also be some cheaper models available. Well, cheap, of course, in relative terms. Again, I have to say I'm really delighted by how agile the design is, although it's, again, not a small vehicle. I think that's definitely a great design job. Also, this light that goes all around the vehicle. And of course, there will be an additional braking light appearing when you hit the brakes. And talking about braking, Porsche predicts that 90% of the braking processes will actually end up in the recuperation to the battery and just that 10% will be used by the real brakes. So yes, you will definitely save some real brakes. That's normal for the EVs. And of course, you gain back a lot of energy. So um, they promise a very efficient regeneration and that already worked with their PHEVs, for example, had a good experience there in the Panamera PHEV. And here, of course, it's even better with one motor per axle. In the lower end, we have got some, let's say, Porsche retro design here. So also inspired by their combustion engine models. But here, I'm really happy they didn't go for any fake exhaust. It's a very interesting design here in the lower end, this diffuser style. 
oh yeah, I would like to have a blue number plate fitting to the exterior color, but yeah, probably that won't happen then when you have your real number plate on there. So what's your take on design? Please discuss it in the comments. Well, since with EVs we cannot show any engine bay and then talk about the power output and so on, we just do it right here and right now. Price here in Germany for the Taycan Turbo will be about 150k. That's pretty heavy, yes, but if you think about a Panamera with comparable power, that comes close then. 680 horsepower is the power output for this vehicle. Acceleration figure to 100 kilometers or 62 miles now is about 3.2 seconds. And the estimated range, WLTP cycle, is 450 kilometers. That would be about 280 miles. And let me already give you the figures of the Taycan Turbo S, which we don't see at the moment. A little bit lower in the acceleration, 2.8 seconds even, so below this magic three second mark. 760 horsepower, but then a little bit less of the range, 410 kilometers, that's about 250 miles an end. Of course, even more expensive, 185k, that's the German list price then. You also get this app for your phone. At the moment it says Turbo S, but you know that's not true. It's a prototype model here. And uh, it's also in German at the moment, but I just want to show you, you can set the timer, for example, for the preheating. Um, then you see the, the battery status here in this app and can also plan some trips and um, consumption data and so on, tire pressure. So a lot of interesting things to see there. And talking about all the charging data and so on, this one here, the right side now for the DC charging. So 11 kilowatt AC charging would be the top one. And then DC charging has a peak of 270 kilowatt. That's of course pretty massive. For this 93 kilowatt hour battery, yeah, that's size-wise also comparable to the biggest ones you can get in Tesla. Very interesting, definitely here and again you would get on the other side than in the UK model. And what's also interesting with this car here is it has an 800 volt architecture, whereas most other EVs run on about 400 volt. Well, when you reach the maximum speed of this vehicle, 260 kilometers an hour or 160 miles an hour, then those integrated <laughs> handles will do a good job aerodynamic wise. Other than that, the tactile feeling as we experienced in 911 is yeah, not satisfying. So uh, it looks cool, it's good aerodynamic wise, but just how it feels, hmm, not too happy about that. But again, it's the same as for 911. So prefer the old school style as for that. Then this one here has frameless windows, so copé style, and then see it right there, pretty neat. And then everything as on the exterior, the Porsche design scheme is to wrap things tightly. That creates a lot of tension design-wise, the same is done here. Interesting copper tone here, or like rose gold or whatever, um, here for the door handles. That makes a good quality impression as well. Optional Bose sound system, then has a massive Taycan Turbo entry batch. And we can already see there are two steering wheels available. This one here is the GT one. Why? This one has the visible screws right there. So yeah, a little bit more racy, so to say. Then you have this curved display. Soon more deals to all those display because this one is the display car. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Soon more to that. But here already the instruments have this curved, uh, curved design. And the seats, in this case, this one here is the animal skin interior, but happy to tell you that there will be a race tax interior, which is actually totally animal free, both seats and steering wheels. So you can get actually a totally animal free car. So that's more sustainable, 80% less CO2 output, and even the floor mats will be from recycled, uh, recycled fishing nets. So Porsche is definitely heading also into the future. Now, finally here with the Taycan. Getting inside now, and it is actually quite low, so you have a sports car character. And from my first impression, this one to me is, from the feeling, a mix between a 911 and the Panamera. You know, that's how I would describe it. So um, the Panamera feels a little bit more voluminous, a little bit, you know, maybe more like 
settled and the 911 of course maybe then a little bit shorter more agile but this one definitely something in between and i would suggest that we maybe can also expect something as for that for the driving we'll soon see more about that so i have the seat in the lowest position there is a panoramic roof here in build and that's also the reason i have a lot of head clearance still to that but then here to the a pillar it comes quite close so you shouldn't move your head too far over there so a low roof profile but you can be just fine here also when you're a tall person steering wheel with the electric control here up and down and also in and out and yeah so far it's actually um quite cozy i would definitely say it's more comfortable than in a 911 um but maybe the panamera is more comfortable so again i think also something in between those cars this is the interior overview and we can see it's pretty clean definitely here with those surfaces then here this new screen here and well again one two three four screens overall this one the passenger screen is really for the co-driver that one is an option other than that the main setup is let's start here 16.8 inch curved display for the driver display in the middle one the digital suite but this definitely all digital then in the middle here this one is 10.9 inch and the lowest one here is 8.4 inch yeah where to start <laughs> first of all some general information you can see it here you get this analog clock still like in a sports chrono package very beautiful design needle that just belongs to the Porsches. Then again, the steering wheel is common ground, so to say. We know it from the 911 as well. Driving modes can be selected right here. Also, as we know from the combustion engine cars, with a little bit more boost in the sports mode, also Sports Plus, reducing the stability control and so on. This car will still have a real bias because you will get more power than from the rear engine. Well, yeah, and the same also as 911, those parts here, are blocked by the steering wheel mm, so you have to like like uh-huh uh-huh <laughs> yeah hmm. not sure about that so but other than that it's a pretty crystal clear display and this curved function is also let's say quite decent um on the steering wheel you can change the volume here for example um you have some hot keys here you can also program and on the right side here you can choose something in the digital instruments for example change the assisted systems you can change through those instruments what you want to hear what you want, want to see here's for example the gps map can be put in the middle that's of course quite handy and then the right side here too you can have sport chrono information there as for the lap times then the central screen we also know this from porsche already it has been a little bit reorganized for this ev Let's take a look at the GPS right here. So it's quite responsive, as we can see. Looks also nice as for the visualization. The home menu will look at this phone, either with Bluetooth or with Apple CarPlay, as we know from Porsche. Then we have this menu also for the drive modes, for example, chassis control, because the air suspension is adaptive, will also then increase the stiffness for example a leveling and is also available lift for example for your basement garage maybe then again the driver's display is let's say not the main focus of this vehicle um again also just uh, the sorry the co-driver display just an option more important is the lower screen here because here you can actually for example open the front trunk and won't press it right now because i have the closing it, or the rear trunk you can also open the charging infrastructure and other than that it would serve here as the you can deactivate or activate this haptical feedback i always advise against it because you cannot click it that easily um, but it should be possible also to deactivate it as we know from audi so this one will be rather the ac menu but also some hotkeys again for example for the gps and so on or then the lower part here again for the status of your battery yeah so i think this lower display is the most helpful one maybe a little bit display overkill or what's your take on that other than that besides the display the design is quite clean also with those cup holders got the key by the way which is here standard porsche like this uh, adaptive cup holders also for huge bottles that will be pretty famous with our fans in the US oh and then in the in the very front here by the way I can just go around it like <laughs> this is like a you know space but not sure you shouldn't put too many things uh, below that because it will maybe slide all over the place 
Then there's another cup holder right there. And last but not least, there is this armrest you can fold up. And then we have two USB-C devices underneath and an inductive charging device. And here the co-driver display. So when you are rally co-driver, for example, well, it's basically the same as in the middle one, just for the co-driver. So a little bit more put to the right. So yes, indeed, you're not seeing the central display. This one is the right one. But again, it's like a complete mirror. It doesn't change what you see on the, uh, on the middle part. So it's independent, yes. But it's the same functionality as the middle one. A little bit unnecessary, isn't it? Or what's your take? Let's now get into the rear. Well, it doesn't open too wide, this door, so you have to squeeze yourself in. But first look here, this one is the split seat layout. But you can see there is a third seat officially with a hidden seat belt, so to say. But the main layout is definitely that you have two passengers in the rear with isofix on the outside. You can see um, there is a middle tunnel, although there doesn't need to be any mechanical link between front and rear axle, actually. So um, the reason for that is, first of all, structural, stru structural rigidity, and also you have to put the battery somewhere. And the space you have then here, it's a low sitting sports car. So when you have like an electric SUV or crossover, you can just put the whole battery underneath the car and no one will care. But here with a sports car, you have the problem. You need the space. It's very low to the to the, to the the bottom. And then they have built in those, so to say, foot garages, they call it that way, that there's space left in the battery layout that you can still sit in the rear. Very interesting sports car EV detail. And does it work for me? I mean, the car is long enough. It should offer enough sp space and... It works here when I'm driving in the front as a tall driver, yes. Um, Headroom-wise, to the middle it's no problem again because it's a fixed glass roof. To the sides I do touch here, you know, the side pillar, but just slightly. So it works for four tall adults, yes. Is it the coziest experience here in the rear? Rather no. It works, yes. Okay, but again, there are definitely better cars too be in the rear I think you can flip the seats already from here interesting that the side part of the seat stays where it is actually that's interesting but of course we'll take a look at the trunk very soon in the middle here yeah <laughs> about that you can sit here it's not that comfortable and I also hit my head and so for emergency situations when you need to drive with five people at the same time then you have an armrest with decent adaptive cup holders. And you also can use this one here as a middle ski hatch to load things through. Oh nice, this letter part here, this one is also covered with Alcantara, so behind the seats. And then the middle console will also you know, feature another display. So here you can also see, for example, some more AC uh, information and so on, but again, Pretty large middle tunnel still. Yeah, in a way you don't use all the advantages of an EV then, but again, the reason is because it sits so low and supposed to be that sporty. You open the rear hatch with the car key from the inside of the car with the display, or then here with the button at the lower end, and it doesn't open all the way fastback style, but rather like this, but still you can access it very well. It's a little bit shallow, yes, it's 370 liters. You are somewhat limited. You have a 12 volt power supply in the rear. Then this lower cabin is here for the charging cable. So that's definitely a clean solution. And as I said earlier, you can flip the seats from the rear compartment. Like this, for example, this one be one. Then there's this middle ski hatch. And then there's also the last one. Yeah, that's Thomas work out here for you today with the Taycan. And here we go. And then you have a quite even loading surface even. And in the front, you have another 80 liters. So of course, somewhat limited. There will be the um, emergency triangle right here and here. And then again, some more space right here in the front. And now to our conclusion for today with the all new Porsche Taycan. Finally, there is a competitor to the Tesla Model S by Porsche and also they're going more in a sustainable way. Yes, EVs are locally emission-free. Of course, the energy has to come from somewhere and there are also other raw materials involved in production. There are different studies which is like more sustainable now. It depends on, on the long run 
we are pretty certain that everything will be electrified. It's just a question like, you know, how, uh, how exactly it will be electrified. But that's definitely a step in the right direction, technology-wise, and it's supposed to be quite efficient. Of course, in the driving review, we will find out if that's true. Exterior-wise, it looks pretty sleek, although it's not a small vehicle. It looks way, way smaller than the Panamera, just, you know, when seeing it live here in person, although it's just slightly shorter. So I think design-wise, a very interesting job. You still have some decent interior space, yes, of course, the package overall is not good. You don't have too many, too much, uh, you know, luggage capacity and the rear is usable for tall adults, yes, but it won't win the price for the most practical car. Yes, it's more supposed to be a sports car and, as I said earlier, from the interior feeling, something between a Panamera and a 911, at least to me. That's, you know, how to describe it, I think, in the easiest way. Interior also pretty cool that they offer a vegan interior, so because it really fits when you build an electric vehicle that's supposed to be more sustainable, then you also have to be sustainable on the interior, that just makes sense. And of course it also has practical advantages like staying cooler in summer and also warmer in winter when you sit on those race tech seats. So would we'll look forward to test this version also very soon and present it to you. And again, technology and Performance-wise, the figures we heard were very impressive. You can also compare them to the main competitor, yes, so pretty fast. How will it drive? We'll keep you updated with that. I really hope you enjoyed this first look with exterior and interior here. Please subscribe to us if you haven't done so far. And I hope to see you next time with a combustion engine car still or with our next EV review and latest when we take this one here on the road, which we're really looking forward to. This is the future of the Volkswagen brand, their first all-electric vehicle which sits on this new electric building platform, the VW ID3. Here on Autogefühl, we'll take you on a tour on exterior, interior and the technology features. Subscribe if you haven't done so far. And now, let's see, what about this new vehicle? Will it have success? Let's check out in full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go. In the front you can see a very round shape overall, it reminds of the VW Beetle and this is also somewhat where this three name comes from. There was the Beetle, number one, there was the Golf, number two and this now here as a third very important significant iconic car in the hot studio here. <laughs> also the cooling of the car is, getting, uh, is, is running by the way, if you hear some sound now. So the third very significant car, therefore VW ID3 and you can see here in the front there light signature very interesting in the lights right there then also the stripe that goes all over the car from right to left new vw logo which has some kind of retro styling headlamps start with led and then optional you get matrix led and this color here is called makena it's a place on hawaii on maui so very you know sea inspired but there will be of course other colors available 4 meters 26 14 foot or 168 inches is the length but the wheelbase is 2 meters 76 or 109 inches. And that means that the wheelbase is about 13 centimeters or 5 inch longer than one of the VW Golf, whereas it has the same length than the VW Golf. So the overall length like Golf, but the wheelbase here like a Passat. That's very interesting. We'll have an effect on the interior of the vehicle. Wheels come with 18 to 20 inch. Those ones are the biggest one, 20 inch. Different stylings available. This one here is this aerodynamic styling. First edition. This is a special first edition where you can pre-order and then later on you will get different trims. This one here is so to say the max trim for this first edition. You have contrasting mirror caps right there. Then the door handles we already know from the Golf standard one here. Then the dropping line design wise right there 
you can get a dual color right there for example here you have a black roof then this one is also one with panoramic roof and this is then a you know special foil here in this um honeycomb design you also have in the front of the headlamps you see uh, it has some kind of a van shape and you can see those very very short overhangs this is bringing you space on the interior pretty interesting and this new meb the modular electric building platform they're using for those cars why are they doing it because they want to build 10 million cars from all different brands, so not only Volkswagen on this one platform, then it saves money to have an own platform for that. And that means the batteries are placed in the lower floor right there, as you know from all electric vehicles. You can also see it here in the cutaway model. This brings down the weight of the car, you know, this, not down in, in, in sense of less ground, but it down to the ground, so a lower center of gravity, that is better for agility. And they went for rear wheel drive here, for packaging and also for weight balancing reasons 50 50 percent weight balance very interesting and two horsepower specs either 150 or 204 horsepower so this promises some agile driving but tell me what you think about the design in the rear you can see this black panel design then again this new retro vw logo and those tail lamps are pretty modern definitely but again, it has some kind of, you know, this typical head shape they have here in the rear. So it does not look like a very sporty rear-wheel driven car. But I mean, the electric motors, they have instant torque, then this weight balance, then the low center of gravity. So quite possibly it will drive very sporty. Maximum speed, by the way, is 160 kilometers an hour. So that's about 100 miles per hour. That's, of course, not super high speed German motorway. But for most countries, this will be totally sufficient. Yeah, and for most German traffic situations as well. And what's interesting, talking about the warranty of the battery, you can actually remember that by the speed figures. So 160 kilometers now maximum or 100 miles per hour, and that's also in hundred thousands, the maximum warranty of the battery they're giving either eight years or 160,000 kilometers or 100,000 miles. And now we have a different trim, a different color for you. This one here in glacier white. Very interesting and I think hmm, it looks pretty pretty good in this black white trim, doesn't it? What's your take on that? Also this retro VW logo uh, somehow works very well with the white car then and indeed it looks a little bit like the original concept car. There was this very interesting episode where we had the Beetle, the Golf and the concept of this car. We will also link that and you can also you know compare it. We had an interesting interview also with Klaus Bischoff, head of design there. So tell me, which car do you like best so far here and would you take it in this one here? Here, by the way, 19-inch wheels. I think that's a very good compromise between you know the visual and still having a little bit more comfort. Because if you think about 20-inch wheels, yeah, that might cost you a little comfort. It will also just come with a standard suspension here so far. So there are no plans for DCC yet for the dynamic chassis control adaptive suspension. But I could imagine that it will also come at a later stage. And in the rear, when the car is in white exterior color, this black panel design also forms an even stronger contrast. And you can even better see this ID3 logo. The official writing is indeed ID.3. And, but here I think it looks a little bit strange because the dot is so close to the D uh, and then there's space to the three. Yeah, but you know, that's a minor detail. Um, detail? Beetle? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, I personally would have wished if this car would have had a real name, you know, like the Beetle or the Golf. Or do you think like in this ID name, you know, it also stands for this Volkswagen ecosystem that you log in like with an Apple ID, you log in with a Volkswagen ID and then have your own software ecosystem inside the brand. That's, you know, the thought behind it. What's your take on that? And talking about the different battery sizes here again in the cutaway model where you can very well see again how it's placed in the lower end of the vehicle and here the rear wheel drive this one is here is the electric motor this is also the place where you can recharge the car talking about recharging at the moment maximum 100 kilowatts dc later on there will be 125 kilowatt dc charge available and ac charging up to 11 kilowatt and then there are three battery sizes actually 48 kilowatt hours 55 or 77 so those three sizes available and of course the price differs and Volkswagen promised that the entry price 
for example, the German reference, is below 30,000 euros than with the smallest battery. And if you pick like the mid-range ba uh, battery and some trim, and you might end up like 40,000, 40,000 plus something. Um, so, yeah, it's something like a high-trimmed Golf diesel that will be approximately the price region. And the ranges you can get from those batteries will vary about 330 to 550 kilometers. That's about 200 to 350 miles. Just to show you briefly what's under the front hood, well, not much. It's more like for servicing fluids and so on. Um, so there's nothing really spectacular interesting here. The normal car battery is still right there. So just a short impression right here in the front. this interior come inside this is an early prototype model so some finishes will be nicer than you see it at the moment if this one remains hard pack or will be soft touch we don't know yet we have to see about that leather red inside here and the insert then some reasonable space here at the inside of the doors but not too high for bigger bottles then you can see a lot of buttons have gone those are rather those touch fields then for example for which light mode is on then you can see the steering wheel has a modern form or inserts right there like we know from the t-cross then a small screen for the instruments and the interesting thing it moves alongside with the steering wheel i'll soon show that to you those ones are the ergo active seats uh, beautiful seats here with a fabric uh, living room style gray fabric here then the brighter microfiber right there so visually a very nice job already and standard this car will also come animal free because they wanted to be a sustainable car. Also, it is CO2 neutral as far as it goes, as far as it is possible. So what's the concept there? Of course, there is CO2 output during production and they try to, for example, power the plants then with renewable energy and where you cannot, you know, go around the CO2, they have, for example, forestation projects, you know, where they plant some trees to even this CO2 out. So very interesting and good that they finally take such an approach, especially, you know, considering the latest background with the diesel scandal then. So, but good that it comes animal free, but not in all trims. So, for example, when you go for more elaborated assistance systems, where you have the capacitive steering wheel, which then realize that you're still holding onto the steering wheel and therefore it's not cancelling the assistance systems, you get the animal skin steering wheel, for example. They are working also on different materials for that. But again, you can get it animal free if you like. Then, as I said earlier, right here, the steering wheel moves together with the display. That's very interesting. Um, the good thing is, at no point the steering wheel does block this display. Like, you know, we know from recent Porsche developments, for example. You have a gear selector right there. This is very interesting. Um, just have the parking mode here and then we put in the gears like this for reverse or for, for D and then P again. Oh, this guy is actually able to drive. I could drive the car now. <laughs> so this one and the very interesting gear selector and of course, you know, just the speed you can see here. So they try to limit it a little bit. There's a head up display built in here. It's not in function right yet, but there's like, you know, like a hole in the front. Um, so you can see it also the other car we have here does not have it actually. So you can see the difference in later. But the head, head display will definitely be a very interesting addition. So in seating position, it's a little bit like in the Golf. Um, there's enough headroom. I'm only 86 or 6 with 1 if you haven't subscribed yet. This one here with the panoramic roof. The other car we'll uh, show to you very soon does not have one. Um, electric seat control right there. And yeah, I mean... It's a standard compact size car seating position here in the front. So not like you would say, oh, this is like the comfort heaven, but it's not uncomfortable at all. So I can very well imagine also as a tall person to sit here also, you know, maybe for like for mid-range driving, which also the battery is set for. Oh, and Volkswagen seems to become a little bit playful even. Look at that, the brake with the pause button and the pedal with the play button. So yeah, why not? It's a 
nice and funny idea. This is how the new khaki looks like, by the way, slim and elegant, open and close, and also in this black panel design. So the interior overview, by the way, if you hear the vents blowing, that's the case at the moment here. It's very hot in the studio and I cannot turn them down at the moment. So again, this is a prototype stage also of the infotainment system. But the basic overview first, here is soft touch, a bright one at, um, at the top of the dashboard, then this LED ambient light, very beautiful. A simple setup, always with this 10-inch screen. It will always come in this very size right here. Again, you can see the setup here with the big screen and the rather small instrument, but you can very well read it because it's very close to the driver. Then again, the retro logo here at the steering wheel. There will be some commands here, for example, for the cruise control or for the volume also at the steering wheel. Then everything is, so to say, almost buttonless. Of course, you have the hazard lights right there, for example, a climate hotkey um, for assistance systems that you can deactivate, maybe a lane assist if that's too annoying. And the temperature control will also be here that you can swipe here for plus or minus temperature or here also for the volume like this for the audio. But again, zoom out to the details, then everything clean right there. There's a glove box, for example, in lower part, but this is not a final production stage. Lower part right there. You can put, for example, a smartphone or something. Then the adaptive cup holders right there. Then some you know, additional, for example, also smartphone holders or whatever. And then you have those, like in a, in a T6 or something, those <laughs> those armrests right here, or like in a, like in the Touareg. And then there's a slider for two USB-C chargers. There will, of course, be smartphone connectivity available and a lot of space here at the mid middle part. You can also um, you know, just you know have those um, inserts right there that you can split the room, but that's again because the middle tunnel is free you can have more possibilities here in the, in the middle in this electric vehicle. And again, this is not final stage, but just to have a brief overview, not even sure if it will stay like this, but there is, will be the space app overview. Then you, for example, have this home screen where you can see the GPS, and then driving data, for example, like this. It, you know, we know it already from the Golf, for example. Then this one here is like a home button, also a visual home button. So just an approximate impression how it will look like um like this but again it will have a different setup but we can expect you know something similar than we know from the 9.2 inch screen of the Volkswagen Golf for example by the way although this is a prototype it already has a nice door closing sound yeah that's the Volkswagen finish as for that yeah this one again is not ready yet we have to see about that later in the final production vehicle then but of course similar styling and when you take a look at the styling in the rear you can see it's the same in the front nice here also in this high trimmer with a gray fabric again and the bright microfiber isofix at the outside of the seats each on the outer seats but you can see the bench is falling way backwards somehow. Hmm, what about the seating comfort there? We'll soon experience that. And you can already see from here two USB-C devices there in the middle tunnel, which is not a real middle tunnel, since this one here is the MEB building platform. You do not need this middle tunnel anymore, so it goes almost, yeah, it's a small step. It's, um, for example, often done, there was a suggestion by you, one of you guys, um, for structural rigidity. Um, so just a small step in the middle, but it's actually quite good because then you can move around here in the middle seats. The middle part is also actually quite soft from the seating, but a little harder from the back. So I can sit here as a tall adult in the middle, but more important, what about the normal seats here? And yeah, this is the space I would have in the Passat indeed in front of my legs. So yes, it's actually true. Golf on the outside, Passat on the inside. That's then the advantage of this long wheelbase, which is again possible by this electric building platform. This car, by the way, is built in Zwickau, Germany. They will use only electric cars then in this very plant. That's very interesting. Oh, and by the way, if you want to know, the battery cells are from LG. So, headroom then here. Yeah, that also works then for tall people. Here it's almost uh, all open now. Then you can see you can look through. It cannot be open as for you know like a folding roof there's just a shade that goes in the front and in the back so the only thing here in the rear I mean it's it's decent as for space it's just that you lean very far far back you know see here this angle mm, so far it's, it's nice but I'm not sure how it is on long-term run when you like fall backwards 
for sleeping maybe nice other than that hmm, that's maybe something i don't like that much yet so here you can flip the seats from here and then there's the middle armrest right there with cup holders and can also be used right there as a ski hatch like this yeah this retro logo has something um, i found it quite cool what about you tell me so then the hatch there is this floor cover where below that you can for example store some charging cables we also know that yeah it's like a golf style definitely and square dimensions so what about those dimensions the normal length of the trunk here is about 80 centimeters and the width is about a meter and the height here up to the cover is about 40 centimeters and i have already flipped one seat and to the driver's seat i would be driving that one then is about 1 meters 55 and now i go around and also flip the rest you can also see how the ski hatch could be applied right there and then here we go with the maximum setup oh i think i have the the cover here I haven't put it in properly so the right side is a little bit higher yeah that's the way that now it looks better so this one then is the full setup i think very well usable overall of course you can also just remove this lower floor cover to have a little bit more height and i want to open the hatch once again and just to show you I mean, like this cut cutting out job here this is pretty hmm, unique right so not sure what to think about it yet but it's definitely special so different interior trim here also for example, you can get different colors for the inside of the doors and also this panel here in white. Also, the steering wheel is available in white, but at the moment when you have it in white, it will also come in animal skin spec. So that's a warning from my side. Then here again with this brown contrast. Uh, but I think this dual color design for the interior is very interesting approach, definitely. Also, and again with the retro logo right here. Prototype software standings here in this display. So just to show you a little bit more variation how it can actually look like but my favorites are indeed the seats here again um, you know they're the same in this car and also in the other car where they also have this dual tone design so you know pretty cool leather right here on the top part so we can expect a lot of different trims here and again this new living room design is something which is prevailing in electric vehicles because they want to make the car a little more like say like hospitable <laughs> how can you say you can look here in the rear different colors for that you will have again different color choices especially also for the interior so again a little bit more playful than maybe some of the past vehicles we've seen and now to our conclusion for today with the volkswagen id3 will it be as iconic as the vw beetle or as the vw golf we do not know yet it definitely means a lot for the company and i think this paradigm shift you know thinking about the co2 neutral um, production for example being more environmentally friendly being sustainable this is also something that you know comes from the background it also in this case has to come from top down and this car is supposed to stand for that of course we'll follow the development if they really stick true to their word because that's also something which is very important to us here at Autogefühl. On the exterior, you definitely see some quotes of the VW Beetle, so it has some retro elements, also fitting to this new retro style logo of VW, especially then with the short overhangs, the long wheelbase, the car appears bigger than the Golf visually, but it's actually the same length, as I said. And indeed, it is true that it has an interior space of a Passat, especially a lot of legroom there in the rear. Not exactly sure how comfortable it is because the rear bench is like falling so much back backward that it would be one criticism point in the interior. The software and the infotainment was not ready yet, so we cannot rate that. So we have to do that at a later stage, but we of course keep you updated on that. But the setup with the small screen with the steering wheel that always moves together with the steering wheel actually makes sense. Nothing is blocking your view. There will be a head-up display available, as I said, also. And the screen of the central infotainment is also actually right-sized. Hardly any buttons left. Everything a very clean layout. So this already looks quite promising. And on the one hand, they can use existing stuff like, you know, 
be door handles or the door closing sound, which is like very solid in the Volkswagen Corporation. Of course, on the other hand, they have to work on new stuff which hasn't been there before. So it will be very interesting if they can live up to this challenge. Again, about 30,000 sold so far. So basically all pre, pre-sold cars, which could be pre-sold, are actually sold. So um, this is a first positive sign. Of course, it will be very interesting if they can, for example, keep up with the sales of a Tesla Model 3. If you think about this, you know, German internal um, uh, competition, we recently had also the um, Opel Corsa E, the electric version of the Corsa, and that one, you know, was also about the same price in, in a somewhat entry spec, but with some equipment in, in it. But this one here actually is, of course, I mean the same size then, um, same sorry, the same price, but a bigger size, so you get more car for the money. So. Could this then be the German electric car for the masses? Probably yes, because they built so many cars on this very platform that they can also offer it at an attractive price. And this will be probably the most important thing about this vehicle. Battery size and range will be enough if you want so. It depends on your driving profile. If you don't drive so you know, long kilometers in one route, then you can also save money and go for a smaller battery. It's actually also more environmentally friendly then. And if you really want to you know, go all the way, you have to invest a little bit more money and that, of course, get a little bit more range. Of course, now interest to look to your feedback. Please give us some comments here on the ID3. Let's discuss this car and we'll keep you updated, of course, very soon with driving it. This one here, the Audi RS7 Sportback is probably, maybe we can agree on that, the sportiest Audi, just from the look. But what else? What about the power? What about the exterior details and the interior? Let's find out together on Autogefühl. Let's go. It's not a small car, but it just looks so sleek in the front. Yes, of course, also wide, but sleek in a very sporty way with those accentuations on the hood and those headlamps here. They either come with LED as standard, and usually it would be the next step, matrix LED and then the laser. But here for the RS, they directly hop from the LED to the matrix laser LED. And then you also have this blue ascent in there and also special for the RS, a dark background all around inside the headlamps. Very interesting. Stronger front grille, carbon fiber pack here with a lower spoiler and you have those glossy black paint all over the grille. And you can also get black Audi rings. You do not have to get them, but you can. And one of my favorite features is obviously the, you know, the cascading turning indicator light always looks very spectacular. And this design here was obviously, you know, that well, uh, perceived inside Audi design that they landed that one for the Audi RS6 Avant, the whole front. You can also check out that review on Autogefühl. The length is at 5 meters, 16 foot 4 or 197 inches and that's actually a couple of centimeters longer than the normal A7 just because of those strong spoilers front and the rear. The car is then overall a little bit longer but of course not chassis wise or something like that. Then here 21 inch wheels would be standard. Those ones are the optional 22 inch wheels, pretty massive. Of course, you will lose some of the comfort then. And there are also the optional carbon ceramic brakes. Well, boost up the price even more. We'll have aggressive braking performance and especially for track use. Yeah, track use will probably not happen with this car. People use it as an everyday driver car indeed. And there are also the air suspension fits to the vehicle. It's set on a sportier note and also a little bit lower, 10 millimeters lower than the normal A7, and it goes even more 10 millimeters lower when you're driving higher speed, more than 120 kilometers an hour. And what's also interesting, you can optionally go for a DRC, that's a fixed suspension, that has three different levels to pick from, it's not adaptive, but three different stiffness levels you can pick. If you want an even sportier ride than the air suspension, but again, if you want everyday driving comfort, I cannot really recommend it. Special about the 
RS7, or in general the A7, is of course this fast back line that's so beautiful and so sleek in design. The RS gets also, when you want, a carbon lip in the lower body, also can pick different contrast colors for those. Tango Red is our vehicle color for today. And again, this is just such a lovely area with a strong shoulder, you can look at it all day. I really needed to show you this three-quarter rear perspective. This is the chocolate side of the A7 in general. Wow, I mean, this is such a design object. And Audi Sport decided to bring this one here, the RS7, as the top model, together with the RS6 Avant, and not go for the A6 Sedan. And that's the same what they also did with the mid-sized model, so where we have the RS5 and also the RS4 Avant instead of the RS4 Sedan. So very interesting strategy and this one has the sportiest look, yes, and maybe also the sportiest engine fits to it. You can see this light strip goes all over the car, as well as the width, and also has a different form than when you look at it from here, from the A6 and the A8, they all have their, you know, somehow, somehow a different form. The A7 more goes like this, the A6 is more like straight, and the A8, more goes like this so like audi rings you can see it right there you can also opt for brighter ones i mean also what another perspective you can look at it all day technology highlight wise what else is interesting you can have a rear axle steering optional so that goes five degrees in the opposite direction than the front wheels at slow speeds two percent in the same direction at higher speeds to stabilize the car and you can also get a sport differential lock here for the rear axle together in one dynamic package. Both in the front and in the rear, the RS7 is two centimeters wider per side than a normal A7, again to stress this width. So most of the parts on the exterior, like the very exterior parts, are really specific for the RS7. And then you can see here this very interesting floating spoiler with the diffuser style also honeycomb structure inside and in this case again with a carbon fiber package but again you have some other options for that too rs7 batch right there and then this exhaust the outer tip is just you know for beauty it's also a little bit exaggerated i think the real tips are on the inside but at least it's not a pure fake exhaust this one here the performance exhaust the normal one has a chrome frame around it and this one you know might sound a little bit different we'll soon also again find out well, the Audi A6 sedan has more downforce due to the building form here with the A7 Sportback. It's actually, uh, you know, less downforce at the rear and that's why you have this additional wing that folds out automatically when you drive really fast. But when you just want to play around or show off to your friends, you can also press a button in the infotainment screen. So, whereas the S models get a 2.9 liter V6 petrol or a 3 liter diesel in Europe, yeah, the one with the fake exhaust. <laughs> Here, the RS model gets the 4-liter V8 bi-turbo petrol engine, 600 horsepower, 800 newton meters of torque, and the acceleration figures are 3.6 seconds to 1 kilometers or 62 miles an hour, and 12 seconds to 200 kilometers or 125 miles per hour. That's of course pretty massive. Combined with the converter automatic gearbox, all-wheel drive setup is 40% front, 60% in rear, then a little bit adaptive, can put a little bit more to the rear, but also a little bit more to the front, depending on the situation. But definitely you have a rear wheel bias. This is the car key, RS batch at the other side. Keyless entry works like that when you put your hand on the outside, it closes. That's the way it is. And the inside, it opens the car again. You could also maybe hear the click. Here's also a soft close if you want that option. Don't need it, but it's a nice function, definitely. Then the A7, of course, with those frameless doors. Here with the windows, double insulation layer you can also see right there. Then at the inside of the doors, also nice build quality with a carbon fiber style inlet here. Also some Alcantara use at the inside. Good quality for the buttons too. Two memory seating slots. Well, just place for small bottles at the inside of the doors. And there's an RS7 entry batch together with some special RS floor mats. That's a design package too with the floor mats. Yeah, floor mats quite often are an extra at the vehicle too. And then 
My favorite for today is this Alcantara steering wheel. First of all, because it has a sporty form, also has a flat bottom and a very good grip with this microfiber surface. This sport seat here is standard. You can also get it with the Alcantara on the inside, what we would recommend. And this one here is the RS seat with the integrated head restraint. However, if you want more comfort, you can also get another comfort seat, also with Alcantara, for example, at least on the inside. This one then the full animal skin spec also with this quilted structure, which looks cool, but those stitches and also this structure here is not that comfortable on the long-term run. That's my experience with the previous model of the RS7. Let's get inside and the A7 in general has this flatter A pillar already, so you don't have so much space in the interior here as you compared for the A6. But still, it's not such a huge difference. One meters 86 or 6 with 1 still have another head clearance right there and somehow you do feel that you're sitting in the 7. It's just a little bit cooler and you know it has such a cool design on the exterior. Somehow you always feel it on the interior. I really love this vehicle for you know for the driving also. Um, haven't driven the new generation RS7 yet of course. We will soon deliver it to you but the previous one also drove very well. Again you know it's good when you stick with the air suspension, stick with the uh, you know, with a comfort seat then, with the Alcantara, then it makes it better. And probably with the 21-inch rims, that would be my comfort tip for today. Those ones here are the electric seats. You can put them up in the front. You can also put the lower area a little bit longer. That's just a manual one now. In this case, there's also electric steering support. But I wouldn't bet on it that this, this is not an extra. Usually the A6 comes first with the manual steering support but it also does the job. And one special RS feature you can already see here is that they are real aluminum shifting pedals, so they are also a little bit different than the normal ones. The interior overview, everything is really clean. Then you have this dashboard where you can maybe have breakfast or something <laughs> together with your co-driver. That would be a nice idea, wouldn't it? Hmm. Yeah, but you know, when I'm driving a car, there's no food in the car. Sorry about that. Yeah. What about you? Food allowed in your car? <laughs> Tell me in the comments. Nice quattro bed right there. It will also be illuminated from the LED ambient light. Then you have a 10.1 inch top screen here, 8.6 below that. They also play together. Soon more details to that. And the virtual cockpit here, 12.3 inch. And there's a new RS mode button right there. When you click it, it changes the virtual instruments and you can go to two RS modes you can configure here right there. I'll soon show that to you. Other than that, you control the volume here at the right side of the steering wheel. You can also have the voice input. Set temperature to 23 degrees. That's a bad idea for the day. Yeah, that works. So that works. And for example, for the GPS map input, like drive me to Berlin or something, you can say, but yeah, that's a bad idea for today. So hot in this car at the moment, in this studio here. And then the left side, you can control the digital instruments. You will be able to zoom in and out of the map. That's a very good function for your left thumb, for example. Then a nice Alcantara cover for the shifting lever right there. There is an Audi AI button. This Audi AI button, very interesting, it does not belong to this very vehicle. This one here is a prototype vehicle, therefore they just put it in here like as a test. This button you will have at a later stage in those big Audi models and it will be a button for extended self-parking functions. Very interesting, so like more semi-autonomous functions. There's a camera button available, then you can also go to the 3D view and have a beautiful view of the car. And this is actually a live camera image where you can also protect your precious wheels right there. And a volume knob is still left here, other than that everything is done with this infotainment screen. Last thing you can see here are those cup holders which are adaptive and have some 12 volt power supply but there will be more power sockets soon to come. GPS right there, look how fast this visualization approaches. Wow, it's really very cool. And you, know, you can also get a satellite view for it. Other than that, the main menu is in an app view, so to say, easy to learn. Phone wireless CarPlay is now available for this car also, or other cable connection for the Android Auto or the Apple CarPlay. And oh no, we don't want any traffic information right now. And what else is interesting, definitely here this car menu where you have the RS monitor with special gauges, tire pressure loss indicator, or also the car temperature for the coolant or the engine oil. You can see different stages for that. And the G meter also as a 
big visualization here in the middle part. What else? In the Audi Drive Select, you can have different driving modes. Dynamic mode will lower the car with the air suspension, make it sportier even. Then you can go for RS1 or RS2 modes. And then you can have the different settings here for those modes, which then can be accessed again with pressing the RS mode button at the steering wheel. Yeah, you know, that's new stuff to play around with. By the way, when you click search here in the infotainment system in the upper part, then in the lower screen you can either use a separate input here with clicking the letters or you can also directly write something, not only as a single letter but also the direct word, like here I write Hamburg. This is a beautiful handwriting, isn't it? No, mine is pretty weird, I have to admit. So and then we can directly access Hamburg, for example, in the GPS. Other than that, when you stay in the home screen, the lower one here will be for the temperature, like this, or clicking. Both is possible, or then the voice input, as I've shown you earlier. This is also the button here for the rear wing, where it folds up and down again. So you can also have some, for, some fun here with the lower screen. But accessing it while driving is somewhat complicated. That's the downside. I really like it when the virtual cockpit shows the GPS map all the way, then you can better follow it, definitely. But you can also change the view a little bit like this or have other information just in your line of sight. And with the RS mode, then you can check it out here. I have the big RPM meter, so there's a special RS mode, and then there's RS1 or RS2, and then the setting will change the way you want to have it. And this is, by the way, the Apple CarPlay integration. So it uses most of the screen. I think the integration is quite good. Here on the left side, you have then also the hotkeys when you are in some of those menus. And the music with this Bang & Olufsen sound system is really cool. It's very in-depth sound, so to say, very crisp and clear. I can really recommend it. Nice. You can slide the armrest forward and backward, and you can also fix it in a certain position. Yeah, there it is, a little slowly, they can put it higher, for example, and all the way up, of course, for inductive charging platform and USB devices, normal ones, classic ones, one and two, here in the front. Well, here in the rear, it's somewhat cozy, yes, there are more comfortable cars for that, but, you know, you feel very much caged in around with this dark ceiling, especially in this case, Alcantara ceiling. There's some reasonable legroom left, that's okay. Of course, there are cars with better packages, also because the rear bench falls backward a little bit. That gains some headroom and legroom, but doesn't make the seating position more comfortable. Yeah, that's how it is. In the middle part, it's theoretically possible to sit, but not that good. I can put my head upright, that's possible, with 1m86 or 6 with one um, Yeah, but that's, that's coming very close. That would be better with the Avant, with the Estate, where the roof is just continued right there. Then there's a four-zone AC unit here in the rear and two more USB supplies. Then we also have an armrest, adaptive cup holders, and we can use this one here as a whole ski hatch. And we can also already flip the whole seat bench from here. There's also a special design package here with those red contrasts. And for example, we also have them here at the seat belt at the outside. So, what about the trunk of the A7? Because the cool thing is, you have a sporty looking car, but then you have this fastback style and you can load things in and out as easy as with a true estate. That's a very interesting approach. Underneath here, there's just some you know, tire replacement kit and so on, tire repair kit. Then there's this you know, fixed cover, you can take it out completely. And then, very interesting, this net here, additional net, you can put it up and maybe to put things here that they don't fall to the interior breaking then. But I'm not sure what, what should you fit in there. Maybe like, you know, from the 1970s, you know, like the toilet paper rolls, which had those self-made covers. <laughs> no, if it's about that, um, especially Germans uh, who drove cars in the 1970s will know it. But, you know, yeah, strange but interesting, definitely. And normal measurements here in the length is about 1 meter and 20 like this and about just over one meter in width. You just limit it a little bit here in height, of course. This is just 30 centimeters in the lowest part and then here up to the cover, almost 50 centimeters. But still, I mean, it's such a good compromise between this sporty look, this approach, and then still able to fit a lot of things in there. Maybe just when you you know have a mountain bike, downhill handlebar or something, would be really like, you know, 
mine are probably like this. Well, some that that won't fit, you know, that will only fit in the state when you, uh, you know, lay them flat. Then that's the only limitation. Other than that, I think definitely better to use than a sedan. And last but not least, we do a child safety test today. After we flip the seats, forgot those. Been a long day for me. Hope you still enjoy the episode with me. So you have to do it from the rear. So you have to go around and do it like this. But that's more entertaining for you than when there's some Thomas workout. Here we go. So and then. For the last time today, we flip out <laughs> this one, so, and this will be, to my seat, about two meters. That's definitely pretty decent. And last but not least, so this one is gone now for today, and now the child safety test. Oh, yeah. That was already pretty strong, so somewhere in between. Not too strong, but also not pretty soft. Yeah, so still okay, I would say, but that hurt a little. So maybe a little bit less torque as for that would be even better. There, ta-da, the full closing. Usually when we do our conclusion, we still have a front or front three-quarter perspective, but with this one, I have to end with this perspective, sorry. <laughs> that wasn't necessary. So exterior, I think we can all agree, such a beautiful vehicle. And even with those very sporty accentuations, with those, yeah, a little bit maybe too extreme exhaust, beauty tips on the outside, half fake, I would say, and those really large rims, it still looks somewhat elegant. And that's no, no, not quite often with those top sporty models. I would probably take less black and more the, you know, the chrome elements, just my personal choice, the red is also pretty cool, but I would also take a Thomas Blue, of course, for this car. The interior has a very good build quality. The touchscreens and so on, they are actually quite easy to learn and everything is very nicely visualized. However, you can always argue if while driving a central control knob is a little bit more practical and safer to use. But voice control now gets better and better. Although Audi, as for the voice input, is not as up to the game with BMW and Mercedes yet. Probably they will change something for the future models there. They have to, actually. Then the rear is uh, the rear and the inside is actually quite well to use still, considering it's a coupé-style car, but it fits still for tall people. And the trunk, actually quite astonishingly, that for such a sporty vehicle, you can easily load things in and out. So that's a unique selling point here, definitely, for the seven models of Audi. Driving-wise, we can expect, of course, a lot of performance. Really looking forward to drive this one, if that really still masters sportiness and comfort. The S7 was a very cool ride, but of course, this diesel, 3-liter diesel power was, you know, somewhat good for everyday driving and a little bit low, lower fuel consumption. This one then here, the true performance version. Let's see how that one plays out. What can they still do? I mean, they have a mild hybrid system and cylinder on demand, so cylinder deactivation technology. So that's something more towards sustainability. Will that drop the fuel consumption? Mm, I'm not exactly sure about that. We have to find out about that. Of course, on the interior, they need to use less animal skin. It's, you know, it's modern times and should be belong to the past, the same as street lanterns are not powered by whale fat anymore. But Audi is also learning. We've seen that with the newer concept models. Other than that, I think it's a really fantastic car. I'm not sure if I would spend all the money for, you know, more than double the base price, at least for this one. Uh, so it will always be way more than 100k. Um, that's really a harsh price, so money shouldn't matter to you then. Uh, I really like a 3-liter TFSI. We've already driven that one. You can check it out, that review in the video description. That is a really cool car and a cool combination. It will definitely be enough, and maybe this one, leave it for dreaming. Or, I really intending to buy this one, then put it in the comments. So let's discuss now about the Audi RS7 and tune into more episodes of Audi RS cars or of course also our full driving reviews with the normal versions. We have everything you need here on Autogefühl. Thank you so much for tuning in. So I have asked you which other cars you want to see from the IAA Motor Show which is not like all new or concept or whatever and you guys wanted to see the Audi A5 facelift because you know this will affect a lot of people and we have it here as the S5 Coupe. In general, we'll tell you everything about the changes for the A5 facelift, for Coupe, Sportback and Convertible, and of course with a small sporty focus. Also one of the reasons you should subscribe to our Autogefuel channel, 
and you can always say which car we should review next or maybe which one is missing. Now, exterior, interior, technology, let's go! LED headlamps are now standard. They are a little bit changed also in the design. Some, some you know, minor upgrades here to the front. The S5 Coupe, of course, has those very sporty accentuations here inside the grille and also contrasting lower bumper. And also a little bit changed area right there. Option, you can also get matrix LED lamps then for high beam function and the highest function would then be that you also have cascading turning indicators and even laser LED rear lamps. Hmm, very interesting. Length 4 meters 67, 15 foot 3 or 184 inches and the wheelbase to the sport bag does actually differ so the length of the sport bag is about 2 inches longer or about 6 centimeters longer than the one of the coupe and the convertible. So this one here obviously coupe with two doors and this very central shape right there. You know Audi is working a little more with edges and strong angular lines and for example Mercedes does. Here in this case this is also a 20 inch wheels, the biggest ones available, pretty massive and they also have a special tire here with this overlapping lip to protect those precious rims a little bit more. Also very interesting color and also with a dark or shadow package here where we have the black mirror caps, also the black frames. There is a new S five batch right there. They try to make the S models a little bit more distinguishable from the normal models. Definitely a very impressive design feature right here. In the rear slightly different design here for the tail lamps. Looks a little bit more modern. S5 batch here since this is a sports version. Then a diffuser and a lower end black contrast and the TDI models for Europe, at least for Coupe and Sportback, they will have absolute blind fake exhaust tip on the right side. And then on the left side you have those exhaust rings with the real exhaust on the inside. When you have the petrol V6, those ones will be real exhaust. About engines, in general for the A5 facelift, still 2.0-liter TVSI or 3.0-liter TVSI then also available in the US, 4-cylinder either with a 2.0-liter or 6-cylinder then here with a 3.0-liter TVSI. And for the S5, for the US you still get the V6 with 350 horsepower, the V6 turbo petrol engine. 4.7 seconds is the acceleration figure to 1 km or, or 62 miles an hour. And then also for the A5 in general again 2 liter tier TDI with a 4 cylinder or 6 cylinder 3 liter TDI. And in Europe the S5 Coupe and Sport Big will be the S5 TDI. Then also with about 350 horsepower but then about 5 seconds is the acceleration figure. That's for the Coupe and the Sport Big. It will be a little bit special with the convertibles. I will soon talk more about that, but again, friends in the US still got the V6 turbo petrol engine. In the European area, everything moves to the S diesel side. Again, different for the RS5, but the S models, because they are actually sold also in significant numbers. Here, in this case, also, you know, with this red cover, because this one here is the S5. And we also always have, the, you know, those... <laughs> details right there. In, in the, it's like 347 horsepower but the real horsepower figure always depends on you know on which market are you. Is it like you know British horsepower and so on. So I think 350 is easier to remember. As I said earlier the facelift for the A5, Coupe, Sportback and also for the convertible. We see it right here in the very special green color. It's one of the 40 TDI but of course will come for all the engine versions here again those new LED headlamps and the convertible beautiful one line design those ones also the big wheels should be also the maximum yeah maximum 20 inch wheels Audi Sport wheels this one here the S line so the true S5 will not look too different actually and then this typical straight line for the convertible right there what else you can see facelift wise of course the interior where we also have this floating screen right there yeah it's a little bit strange how they put the car right there but you can see the new middle screen for that interior 
And one very special thing is for sure that with the convertible, thinking about European customers, and when you get the S5, the S5 convertible is the only chance you can get the true V6 petrol engine for the S5. So Coupe and the Sportback will get the S5 TDI, but as this one is not sold in so high numbers, they also don't care about the higher fleet consumption where they then have to pay extra taxes to your EU. So this one here, yeah, maybe could then be my tip. So if you were one of the S5 in Europe, then you can still get it here as a V6 petrol, as a convertible. And I mean, come on, if there is a choice for a car where it's available as a convertible, why don't you go for the convertible? <laughs> At least that's what I would do. There are actually more upgrades in the interior, let's take a look at that. But first of all, of course, for the A5 in general, those frameless doors are characteristic here for the Coupé. Convertible, also for the Sportback, pretty nice. Then, there's some Argentara inserts right there. Interesting style, contrasting to the grey colour. And also the S entry badge, since it was the S version. General for the A5, you can get base seats and you can also get sports seats and the S model gets sports seats standard, but then those ones are the S sports seats, so the second optional sports seat with integrated head restraint. Usually they are a little bit less comfortable and also with this quilted structure, they are also a little bit stiffer as for the seating surface. I do recommend the Alcantara seats that are available or stick with the base seats if there's a base A5. This one here, by the way, you can slide the seat forward or backward. And that way you can also access the rear and you see those ones are rather emergency seats than if you think about transporting adults in the back. Now let's get inside. It is still a mid-size vehicle, therefore it's not too different when getting on the inside. If you think about an Audi A4, but the roof line here is a little bit lower. Still you feel quite cozy in here, a little bit less headroom. So I'm on with 86 or 6 with one that comes quite close actually so you feel a little bit more roomish than in the A4. Still you can find a good seating position, steering wheel, sporty style with this round in the middle and an S flat end and so on. You can control it with the manual control, electric seats in this case and you know it's still decently comfortable and you have a sporty seating position yes but it's not too sporty that you would say uh, you know it cages you in totally, it's super uncomfortable, so I think it's good mix. Material-wise, by the way, good quality here, soft touch on the top board, then there's some carbon fiber here as those inlets and all the buttons and so on that Audi is using. Nice clicking feedback also, so everything is very well organized. And the news is actually more about the infotainment, so I would say Jonas just gets in behind me. Yeah squeezes in behind me. Oh, about that. Let me show you that first because, yeah, I know you guys, this is maybe then the, you know, you want to see me suffer, right? I know. <laughs> so, as I would be driving, yeah, um, yeah. Ugh. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. That's why I prefer the Sportback for reviews. So, uh, Headroom-wise, I do still fit in here. I do hit the head on the ceiling, but you know, just barely. It's barely okay. So, um, middle here with some cup holders as well. Fold them out like this. Two USB charging ports are, by the way, also here in, in the middle part. Then you see here we have those. Glass roofs here, um, it's all, can all, it's also be open actually, and there's also shade. But now when I put the seat back, uh, yeah, well for a short trip maybe to the train station or so, it still works. Of course, you will be a little bit more flexible than with the Sportback. That's why people would go for the Sportback, for, also have of course the, the next door. 
But now Jonas gets here, that we can have a clear shot to the front. I'll start with the 12.3 inch digital instruments here on the left side because because the car is not really battery powered properly and it might dissolve <laughs> after a while. So, and they're crystal clear to read. You can also have a full map view in here, uh, recently seen also in our A4 phase diff review. Then a good grip with, with the steering wheel, although um, the one with Alcantara would be better. Sound control on the right side with the thumb and left control would be how you control the digital instruments. And the big news is here definitely this 10.1 inch screen. It will always be that size. Thank you. Finally, not three sizes anymore. There will be software differences though. So um, they want to give, you know, still keep some extras. All via touch. Um, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto connection is available right there. And also with the newer cars that are coming to the market now, also wireless Apple CarPlay, that's cool. GPS also looks pretty impressive, like this. It's also fast. We are here in Frankfurt at the Motor Show. So that's definitely an upgrade, but the GPS, again, will not be standard. You have to pay an extra to get this software. This one based on a new MIB3 infotainment system platform by the Volkswagen AG. You can still connect your phone via Bluetooth, by the way, and of course the home menu like this. Everything is pretty simple and clean. I really like this system. It's good to control. Yes, you have lost the MMI knob to control it, but you can very well access it also from the driver's area. Yet again, controlling the touchscreen while driving is not maybe clever, but you also have the new voice in input, for example. We could show you when the car is properly powered now. Same here, of course, for the AC unit, which is one of my favorite ones. I like that it's still accessible here with those turning knobs. Two zone AC here. This again is the optional AC unit. That's an Audi or Mercedes or BMW theme. Optional, 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 optional. <laughs> then here again, those carbon fiber inserts. Pretty cool. And Lower part for the drive select, yeah, reaching that while driving is also a little bit complicated. For example, to put in the sports mode and so on. Some USB supply in the lower part, then classic adaptive cup holders. Then there's this small cubby hole right there in the front. And this one at the moment, S5 is made to, um, uh, to the um, converter gearbox, the Tiptronic. And the smaller engines will be the S-Tronic, which would be the dual-clutch transmission. But 3-liter six-cylinders are always with the converter gearbox because more torque, and this one can sustain more torque than both for the petrol and the diesel engines. Still a volume knob here, maybe for the cold drive, I think, when it, hey, Thomas, your music is too loud again. So, turn it down. <laughs> Does it happen to you too? Then, <laughs> in the middle here, the armrest, you can slide forward or up. And then you have the inductive charging pad underneath. And you can see at the moment there's a new USB-C charging device. So you have to split the USB old in the front and C in the back. Let's check the trunk of the S5 Coupe. Of course, it will be the same for the A5 Coupe. The sport bag will have the sport bag opening. So will not be limited like this. This is the advantage of a sport bag, of course. Here you're a little bit limited in height. And the convertible will of course be even more limited but here i can you know you can still live with that and then you have those you no know, those folds here like this for the middle part and this here this is just a release for the other one and here and then you have to go all the way around or push it from here oh, there we go yes <laughs> success and with a beautiful three-quarter rear perspective, we close the Audi i5 facelift here with a special of the Audi S5 Coupe. Yeah, probably the sportiest one as from the look overall. The sport bag is of course more practical and the convertible, the cabriolet is of course, to me at least, always the most fun because it delivers you this open top experience. Which one is your favorite of the A5 model line? Coupe, sport bag or convertible? Please tell me in the comments. The facelift, yeah, some fresh up in the exterior. The S models are a little bit more distinguishable now than to the other models. And especially for the interior with this new infotainment screen, it looks pretty cool. Yeah, the MMI control knob is gone. That might be downside to some. Then again, you have a more sophisticated system, an easier software to control, and also pretty nice as for the big GPS you have there. So smartphone connectivity also has been improved and so on so i think overall you know not too bad what they did there and it's really nice that they have refreshed it now also some significant changes we've seen to the a4 
So the same, of course, A4 and A5, they are both on the same, some would say, platform, share the technology, and that's why also the changes are somewhat similar. So now tune in to the A4 face reviews, for example, and soon we will have also updated driving reviews here with the A5 facelift. Yes, we already know the Honda Urban EV concept, but this one here now is the final production model. It's called Honda E, and it is a small electric vehicle. Can it be a future classic? You already see the design, it is really iconic. But what about the details in exterior and interior? Here in Autogefühl, as always, you know in Full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go! Everyone here on the Frankfurt Motor Show loves this vehicle. Why? Well, it looks a little bit like a Golf 1 and you cannot buy a Golf 1 anymore. And wouldn't you like to buy a Golf 1 electric? Well, this actually comes close to it. Just that Honda decided to go for this move. And I think it's a really bold move and it's a clever move. You see here those round headlamps. They make the car very likable, you know, just friendly overall. And then a very clean and simple design with this one black panel. The illuminated Honda front logo from the concept did not make it into serious production because there are regulations issues in Europe to allow that. But other than that, you get also different friendly colors and the contrast in the lower part. And the car always sits quite low and you can always see in the front, it's really not that wide. That makes it very practical for city use. LED lamps are standard, by the way. Well, what's this black panel here on top of the hood? Interesting. This is the front camera. And next to it, there's a button right there, and then you press it, and ta-da, there we have the charging possibilities. When you park in front of a charging station or something, AC in the top, and of course, the lower one is the DC charger. And it's actually possible to charge up to 50 kilowatt hours, so pretty fast as for a DC charge. Well, let's say fast enough for this small vehicle. Battery size is 35 kilowatt hours, and the range 220 kilometers or 140 miles. And, I mean, that will surely be enough. This one here, the CCS standard. And yes, those big wheels, they can sometimes charge like with one kilowatt or something, but when the battery is not that big, that's totally sufficient. Three meters 92, 12 foot 9 or 154 inches is the length of the Honda E. So yes, it's really short and the turning circle is just 9.2 meters. That's also extremely narrow. So pretty cool to get along in the city. And it also has a good wind efficiency, for example, with those camera mirrors, so no physical mirrors, and they all come as standard. Whereas at Audi, you pay like a couple of thousand extras for that feature. At Audi, I was not really keen on that feature with the Audi e-tron. Let's see how they have a solution for the interior monitors for that. Really looking forward to that. And also those door handles here are integrated and they flip out. Let's see if they found a better solution than Porsche. And then again, this rather boxy shape here, also with a strong C-pillar right there. Also, the handles here for the rear doors are integrated. I'll soon open that to you. And 17-inch wheels we have on here, so kind of retro style. And of course, there are different colors available. Jonas has also shown you some of those in the beauty shots. I think this car is really iconic. What's your take? And the same also counts for the rear again, with a rather simple design layout. And I think on the one hand, this car says, you know, like, cuddle with me, I'm friendly, I'm nice. But it still has enough of coolness effect that doesn't look too friendly or maybe, you know, like childish or something. So I think everyone somehow can, you know, like this car. And I think that's also, I think it's really very successful. Price-wise, by the way, it starts about 34,000 euros. It would be a German reference price and a couple of thousand extra for if you go for a higher trim. Yeah, that's a little bit higher in the entry price than, for example, the Opel Corsa E or the VW ID3. It's also a relatively small car. However, they have more extra equipment already included. So then, you know, it depends on which exact price you compare. Overall, still an attractive offer in those new EV segment. So, under the hood, really interesting. That's more like classic ICE car. Hydraulic struts, yeah, way to go. And got a 100 
50 horsepower electric motor in there and about eight seconds to one kilometers or six to miles now but i mean the acceleration inside the city will be even more significant like to zero to 60 kilometers or something like that so definitely fast enough and well as i said the battery is not too big but this one is really meant to be driven inside the city that's why it's also small and narrow on gets really exciting with the interior those door handles here you push them right here and then you open them like this and um, you can also push them back just easily so they don't feel that awkward so it's actually quite okay then frameless windows that's also you know something emotional definitely pretty cool this has a living room furniture style we see nice high-class fabrics on the inside and this gray Scandinavian furniture style so very well done that reduces the amount of black plastics at the inside of the doors and it's not you know that expensive to produce but it's a good interior build quality i just love that and very slim those doors um, but here of course not too much space for the bottles then first look here again this living room design i just love that it's amazing here wood is being used as a decor element compact steering wheel soon more to those screens 12.3 inch wide screens then six inch for the mirrors and you can see them right here <laughs> here we go so this is a different place to put the side mirror monitors than audi does soon more to that when we sit inside the car i'll explain it all to you seats they look very comfortable also wide seating area and again a beautiful gray fabric design also with sustainable materials that is fitting to a modern ev so very well done honda seems to make everything right with this vehicle so far i'm really impressed i mean we have seen the concept yes but now to see it in the final production model they kept pretty true to their word and they have really good solutions let's take a seat right and now let's get inside by the way if my voice is not as beautiful as usually um please excuse me a little bit sore throat because of so much you know talking and reporting all those days from the motor show <laughs> well but here getting inside is pretty easy the door opens fairly wide so easy to get in and out and you sit relatively low actually and it's you know it's a more open seating position the seats are very comfortable again living room style you can also pump them a little bit up and they're a little bit straighter that's good um, if we put them all the way down headroom wise that still fits with one meter 86 or six with one although there is this glass roof inbuilt with a manual shade and a beautiful bright ceiling it brings more light in the interior just checking here if we can actually slide that open but that seems to be yeah that seems to be a john says no john says no so we can just have some light in here and the shade and that's it but i mean also think about cost savings and of course those glass roofs that you can open are also somewhat a weakness of a car like a weak part always i mean yeah it's a nice oh there's someone left on the seat heating i wasn't like why is my you know why is my butt that hot <laughs> so that was the reason for that so here the steering wheel again uh, very open shape interesting good quality materials for the volume for example right side for the cruise control and the whole quality that it resonates. i mean it's not a super expensive premium vehicle this is the best honda ever really i mean we've never seen such a build quality. oh now i know why that seating is on so I, I i i just touch it with my knee so this is a design flaw but i'll soon show it to you again when jonas is sitting behind me again steering wheel up and down in and out this build quality is nothing which we have ever seen of Honda. This is a massive step forward. I'm so super impressed. Again, this wood right there, this deco element. Good look at the instruments and you know what's happening around you, you know? Everything is upright, slim. You have a you have the best overview here. So um 
I think this car has been really been built, you know, from from scratch. And I think like, what do we need as urban citizens nowadays? You know, what what demands do we have for the car? And I can say this is so far pretty perfect. Interior overview, and again, another wow factor. First of all, everything is clean. Then this living room, wood atmosphere, matte wood, no fingerprints. I don't see any black piano lacquer other than the frames of the screens, so pretty cool. Then you have a volume knob right here and the home button for the screen that you can also access it, you know, um, while driving a little bit better. Vents right there, for example, for your hands or so. Then the climate unit even has clicking sound when turning. So high quality here too. And I like that we still can control it while driving pretty easily. And then this was the one design flaw. But you can also say, oh, I now activate the seat, uh, the, the seat heating always with my knee. <laughs> yeah, oh, I could do this all day. But then maybe in summer times and you drive the car and maybe like have a um, left and corner and then, why is it so warm suddenly at 30 degrees Celsius outside? Yeah, um, but again, still nicely built. Then those two big wide screens and then there's the digital instruments and again you see all oh, those two side mirrors and this is a basic difference to the Audi e-tron. In the Audi e-tron, um, maybe Jones moves on over to the left here for a second, um, in the Audi e-tron the screens were like here and this was really bad. You had to look down and you had to look to the side and this was distracting majorly. Here your view is not like that distance, distant away from the front which is also uh, heated available, by the way, the, the front windscreen. And also, if you look, where would you look when you have the classic mirrors? That's also somewhat this direction. So, I would really like to test that soon out when driving, but it seems to be that it's not such a different um, direction from the look. So, I think it's a clever way to um, integrate that monitor right there. Or also, when you look to the right side here, on the other side, you can easily watch that. So I think they really thought about where do people look when they use the classic mirrors. And that is the best solution. Look at that Audi. Maybe better do it in that way. So, and then we have this integrated panel right there. Yeah, maybe it's a little bit too much that it, we also have it here for the co-driver. Um, here, I think that would have been definitely sufficient. This one then is an all touch screen, for example, also with the GPS here. Yeah, it looks a little bit like tech overload, but again, good responsiveness and the best GPS we've seen by Honda yet. There will also be the smartphone connection available, of course. Connect a new device right there, Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, both via USB. You can browse through the main menu here a little bit. You can also put it to the right side. So um, maybe your co-driver wants to do something more. Uh, so, I mean, it's kept relatively simple as for the menu structure. Maybe it could have been a little bit more intuitive or something. So, um, and again, this dual screen is maybe a little bit overkill. Or what's your take on that? Then we have to, those digital instruments. Maybe I put the screen a little bit higher, then Jonas can see it better. Then we have the digital speed there and some information what's going on and I think that's also totally sufficient. So overall a very nice idea for this cockpit here and you know we have this one panel and it doesn't distract the view too much to the front windscreen. Really amazed. First let's go up a little bit you know to the ceiling again because also the rear mirror is a camera. See here it does not change when I am um, you know change it like this manually. So there's also a camera to the rear. Um, then you can maybe stack up the, <laughs> there it is, other GoPro filming. You can you know, put your luggage in the rear all the way up to the ceiling. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. And I mean, if there's something or maybe like a fail safe going wrong, you do it like this and then you have a normal mirror like this. So there is still the possibility. Very, very interesting. And when you put it on again, the camera is activated. Big windscreens here, by the way, and also the quality here of those details is really good. We have a light right there, then you can also check your beauty at any time. <laughs> and then we go further down again, because first of all, in the front and lower part, this is where you charge your smartphones or at the connection. And they also thought, although there's no middle tunnel in the front, really open space, that's cool. You can put your smartphone right there then when you're charging it or have it connected. And what's also amazing is, you have here a real power plug. You can even charge your laptop, for example, 
while being here. And another 12 foot power supply, so really cool. I love that we have no middle tunnel in the front. Then there's a cup holder you can pull out for, you know, uh, will this work with bottles? Yeah, that shouldn't be too high then, but still a good solution. And then we have the driving mode selector, P, and then you put in the drive mode and start driving and so on. Driving modes for normal or for the sport mode if you want a little bit more punch. And then further down below you have this split. Then you can put more bottles right there, for example, bigger ones, smaller ones, or also, you know, whatever you might want to transport, purse and, and, and so on. So overall, you know, they really thought about before designing this vehicle. That can't be said for all cars, but for this, definitely. Also for the rear seats, you have those integrated handles. And even that, it really resonates a good quality. Then we have the same starting here, almost 90 degree opening of the door to be easy getting inside. And then again, fabric soft cover on the rear doors inside. This is a better build quality than we see with some premium cars that are 100k or something. This is really amazing. Also isofix at the seats each. There are two seats available. Of course, that's totally fine. And remember, it's a narrow car where you can get along in the city very well. And also the nice gray fabric with the bench that goes all the way through. And I mean, it's not the longest car. I mean, 3 meters 92 is really short. But then again, the use, you know, the whole packaging is actually quite good. This is as I would be driving the front seat, I mean, it's not the most comfortable seating position in the rear, but you can actually, for short drives, drive with four tall adults. That is exactly possible. Also, the head clearance. Just can put a hand over my head. So, really impressed here too. Oh, look at that interior lighting here with those four lights. It's also beautifully done. So, yeah, I mean, of course, they are bigger cars, but um, considering this is so super short, it is reasonable space we have here on the rear, so actually pretty cool. There's no middle tunnel since it's an electric building platform, so we can also crouch through. And it's pretty cozy with this bench that goes all the way through. So if you maybe um, put those seats more a little bit more forward and then get in the rear of the car and use a little bit of us for snuggling or something, this could also be a pretty cool idea for an urban EV day. Or Honda E, as they call it now. Then in the lower part, we also have two USB chargers with a classic USB device. I mean, everything here is simple and clean and also with high-class fabrics. You know, that's how it's supposed to be. I can already tell you right now, this one will sell like hot vegan cakes. Taking a look at the trunk. Everything feels very light and easy. Yeah, you're a little bit limited here in width and overall the trunk is very limited. Got some spots for your charging equipment here. This is the normal um, household plug because most of the time when you have a supply at home, the normal household plug will be just fine. You don't need the fast charging and so on. So yes, the trunk is where this car is indeed very limited. However, you can also reach over right here quite easily because it's so short and then flipped the seat bench from here. There's a bag lying on the back on the bench at the moment, so I kind of flip it completely. But here there's top tethers for the child seats available. But then you know it's easy to flip it from here. So I think it's an, um, maybe Jones can come over with the camera here um, over this top cover. So I think it's an interesting solution that they put it right here, this flip, because that makes it really easy to flip the whole bench already from here. And now to the conclusion to the Honda E one of the most interesting vehicles from this motor show. Iconic exterior design. It's small, it's narrow, it's enough size-wise for the city and it's a good package. You still have enough space on the interior and a very thought-out concept. Great interior quality materials, the best we've seen from Honda ever. It's really something completely new. They thought that one through from scratch. A very modern interior also with those screens. Maybe a little bit screen overkill, so I maybe could have reduced that a little bit just. But other than that, very clever interior concept and this will also drive very sporty because with a low center of gravity, 50-50 weight distribution. Yeah, the car is of course heavy as all electric vehicles because of the battery, but still it will surely drive very agile. Looking forward to the drive very soon. Also, the range is enough for the city. It's nothing for, you know, long range commuting or, you know, like, you know, when you drive like 50,000 kilometers a year or something. But for all other purposes, this one is really what modern car customers need, together with an iconic design. And I really think that this one will be one of the future EV bestsellers in this small segment. 
or what's your take? Please leave me your comments and let's discuss here the Honda e. We recently had the preview of the BMW X6 in the new generation in this Venta black color. That was pretty spectacular. But today we can see all the design lines and bring you all the details on exterior and interior. And of course the engine here as the M50i, the so far strongest petrol version. Here as usual on Autogefühl. Please join us. Let's go. The front is stronger than before and as with all recent new BMWs, the double kidney is even wider, especially in this case fits to the X6. Here with a special unique function that it can also be illuminated. You can check it out in our Venta Black episode where we could really very see this illumination that is even allowed in Germany. Pretty interesting because it's not a direct light. Also adaptive air intakes in this huge double kidney. Here the M. 50i has a special sporty look with those sportier lower spoilers here so even more dramatic headlamps now more horizontally drawn come with led standard optional adaptive led and optional optional the led here with the laser light for the high beam function 500 meters of range but not in the us yet as for regulations so it doesn't really make sense in the us but you can get this blue accentuations then design wise so what do you think here first impression of course not too different from the x5 they both share the same platform they are both somewhat similar cars yes of course the main difference from the x6 is coming up now the length is at 4 meters 93 16 for 2 or 195 inches so slightly longer than the x5 but overall same wheelbase same platform approximately the same length, just a little overhang because of the spoilers. That's different to the Mercedes GLE Coupe, which is six centimeters shorter in wheelbase than the SUV counterpart, but BMW thought that doesn't make such a difference. Wheels come with 19 to 22 inch wheels, so only big ones for the X6. Those ones here are the biggest actually. This is also the M Sport batch, so there's the M Sport line or also the X line when you want a little bit more off-roadish look. The M Sport and of course is somewhat standard here for the M50i model, the sporty one also with those fake out, out air takes. In this case they are shut off. Special interesting bronze like color we have here and of course the special thing about the X6 is, oh excuse me, could be, thank you. <laughs> Just a new look for Louis, please here. There is so this falling roof line and of course this strong shoulder dropping line here dividing in light and shadow and then this coupe shape so I think it looks a little bit sleeker than before but of course it's a matter of preference if you rather prefer the SUV or the SUV coupe so please state me that one in the comments which one is your favorite actually X6 or would you rather go for an X5? Yeah, always about those rears of the SUV coupes and as we've seen the Studio Venta Black color, this part you could not really realize. Now we can with the normal paint. You can see here how the design lines shape up there. It's not a simple or clear design, um, definitely something to think about. The tail lamps are now more horizontally drawn, that's a difference to the predecessor generation. And the M50i also has this additional lip right there for a little bit more downforce in the vehicle color, together with the M50i badge. And then, hmm, is there a fake exhaust alert? Yeah, the outer tip definitely is beautiful, but the inside then you can see the real exhaust, but of course a little bit exaggerated on the outside. Or well, what do you think? This one here, the M50i, is that 4.4 liter V8 turbo petrol engine with 530 horsepower and the acceleration figure is 4.3 seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. The smaller petrol engine would be the 40i, the 3 liter R6, so 6 cylinder turbo petrol engine, 340 horsepower, 5.5 seconds acceleration figure and then diesels for Europe, 30d, 3 liter 6 cylinder, 265 horsepower or the M50d, the sporty diesel, 3 liter, 6 cylinder, same engine but 400 horsepower then and 5.2 seconds in the acceleration. Technology wise what is also interesting you get an M Sport rear differential for this one here the M50i also for the M50d 
There is a rear axle steering available to be a little bit more flexible. This reduces the turning circle, makes the car a little bit more agile, so it goes in the opposite direction. The rear wheels then when you drive slower and in this same direction in the front wheels at higher speeds. We've been testing that one out also in the X5 driving reviews, which we will also link there in the video description. So please check them out very soon. And there's also the anti-tilt or anti-roll control to give you a little bit more stability. And with the X6 in general, the suspension settings get a little stiffer set up. There's the adaptive suspension, which is standard. And then you can also get an air suspension. So what about this front seat area? First of all, inside the doors, sensor tech leather red being used right there. It's a nice finish here. They stepped up the build quality if you compared to the predecessor generation. Hofmeister kink design element right there. And also an optional Bowser Wilk and sound system with a really decent and nice sound. The M50i gets this entry batch and also sports seats. So there's a base seat and a sports seat available. Yeah, but then here in the X6, just animal skin materials, that's really not looking forward to the future in 2019. So the X5 also offers sensor tech leather red, which is more sustainable and animal friendly, but this one not available here for the X6. But the seat form itself is quite comfortable. M steering wheel here before the M50i that can also be heated. That is, of course, a great winter function. As for the seating comfort, X5 and X6 are not too different because different you know the, the, the basic forms are just the same steering wheel can be adjusted just like this electronically and the only thing is you feel a little bit more cramped in the x6 yes of course with one minute 86 or six with one you can still sit here still have some head clearance left although there is this panoramic roof inbuilt we cannot move it at the moment but this is also very interesting because it's um, somehow illuminated at night because there are those dots in the glass and then they get light from left and right and looks like a star ceiling pretty nice and it can also be opened indeed that was also one of the questions you had earlier well the roof line here is a little bit you know a little bit more narrow and also lower so in the x5 you have a little bit more spacious feeling because you have more head clearance there then again this one has somewhat sportier atmosphere than because you know a little bit limited right there but overall still comfortable you can put the seat also a little bit up at the moment yeah there it is electric controls here all the way here also for the front part of the seat there's a cozy function usually that's done manually but here then also in an electronic way so yeah i think i feel a little bit more at home in the x5 i have to admit but again you know it doesn't it's not the worst compromise you can still sit here very well in the front also in the x6 interior overview we know it from the x5 it's the very same here in the front Sensor tech leather red dashboard wrapped tightly, great quality and soft touch. Bowers and Wilkins sound system with this bow right there. There's of course an option. Then two times 12.3 inch, and there's you know, only this size then. So on the left side, digital instruments, also with the visualization of the X6 in the car right there. And also in the very same exterior color, like that they pay attention to those details. That's cool. Shifting pedals at this steering wheel compact size good grip handle then on the right side also activation from the voice control or also with saying hey bmw that's possible when the car is properly powered left side would be for the cruise control and also this you know highway pilot mode which is more sophisticated as it's more allowed in the us with more sophisticated functions then the central infotainment screen on the right is again voice control which works pretty well to put in destination but you can also use it via touch and then it is pretty responsive and the GPS by BMW so far was the most reliable for me on the all those events we are on. And you can still use the lower knob for a map hotkey, for example. So you can control it while driving with this, um, yeah, some call it MMI. It's somewhat branded by Audi still, but they don't have it any, anymore. Um, well, this multimedia knob, um, I, I like to use it for zooming while driving, for example, because then you don't have to put your hands right there on the screen. So redundant controls here also at BMW. 
the climate control is here warm and colder you can also use the voice control seat cooling is available especially important since you don't have fabric seats here that would be an easier solution then the volume knob is still manual and has this nice metal knurling around great quality again and less piano lacquer being used here in this m50i interior because this one then has this very spectacular carbon fiber cover also with some ambient light you can see there you can slide this one open then you also have illuminated cup holders and they can be cooled and warmed whatever you desire and in the front inductive charging pad next to a normal cable connection carplay is available in a wireless way here so you can then use that one in combination with the wireless charging pad they still do not offer android auto connection option you can also get this crystal gear shifting lever i found it a little bit distracting because you know the haptic device it's a little bit it's not sharp but rough somehow and also um it has this glare when there's sunlight from the outside i would just go with the standard one and then you'll have like a camera button and also the driving modes you can select sports mode and the esc will draw on back a little bit this model of course here and all wheel drive with a rear wheel bias still a real one and you've also seen and talked about earlier here with this turning and pressing knob which has this very nice um, finish also with a with a knurling around and last but not least we have this split with the armrest split i'll just do it once more also great build quality with the usb-c connector and some cubby hole inside and whereas bmw lagged behind in a couple of the past years as for the interior quality now they are you know really overtaking for example also mercedes here also with the frameless mirror which is a nice and elegant maybe we can also see jonas or me <laughs> and also if we go a little bit more on the top hey guys on the outside i know then here we see those wings here bmw wings and wow this is always cool again there has been an exterior design element before now it's only a design a design element on the interior but i just love this structure please leave me a comment if you were also seeking that one on the exterior light still what about that rear compartment let's get inside here first of all inside of the doors also with the leather red cover high build quality then we have those manual shades here for the kids oh, yeah there we go <laughs> and back again also very nice quality as for the door handles in the rear the, the rear door does not open too wide actually so getting in and out is then not, not too easy and also for installing child seats and so on same styling as in the front and there's also this pet holder available yeah i'm not sure if you really need that it's a possibility probably everyone will rather use his or her own personal device and crash safety wise hmm, i'm also not always convinced of that problem of the x5 and the x6 is the package as for the rear legroom um you see i mean i have enough legroom yes and also headroom that works with one meters a6 or six foot one so no compromise as for help yeah i mean the x5 does have more headroom in the rear but it works here um the rear bench is also falling backwards a little bit more um but then again that's you know giving you more headroom and um also the legroom but considering the length of this vehicle this is very poor legroom so it's a bad package so to say but it's still enough space um you can get along here yes but again for the size of the car i think the rear should be more comfortable i think and also considering the price but that's just saying it on a very high level of course you always have to rate the cars by length and also by the price isofix at the outside here each so for installing those child seats then we have cup holders right here we can flip out together with some cubby hole and the middle part can also be withdrawn then here as a ski hatch let me do that again like this and more features there is a somewhat a middle tunnel yes so in the middle seat yeah it's somewhat possible of course not that cozy but you can drive some ways with five l's with the, with the car and then in the middle part you have also a climate unit if you like it's an option of course seat heating also for the rear seats available and then there's still a cd changer if you like one together with hdmi ports and two usb c devices 
lower end is another 12 for Pauso Bio. Yeah, it's a little bit dark in here at the moment. So, yeah, it's somewhat cozy, of course, with this falling roof. Line. And from here, you also have a view then to this panoramic roof, which again can be open. And you can maybe have a, sh you know, a slight glimpse of this illumination dots. Maybe you can see something of the blue there, but it will play a bigger effect at night, of course. If you compare it to the X5, you lose height in the trunk right there. This is the downside. However, if you compare it to a sedan, for example, you still have this fast back opening to be able to access it quite easily. This is the split cover. You can slide forward like this. And pretty cool is a hydraulic strut here for this lower cover and the additional case underneath. So that's pretty neat. Here on the side with a 12 power supply and we can also flip the seats from here actually and they do flip directly so that's also very nice and then of course you could also remove this top cover the liter figures actually differ about 65 liters to the maximum and 135 liters to the x5 and that means the figure then here for the x6 the little bit you know smaller figure is 580 liters and then with all flipped 1525 liters why do you only lose so little liter figures? Well, they always measure it below this cover and then of course the difference to the X5 is not as big. Just when you stuff stuff, when you stuff stuff, <laughs> all the way up to the ceiling, then it would make the biggest difference here to the X5. Why would you go for an X6 instead of an X5? It's all about the styling, definitely this falling coupe roofline. That's why those SUV coupes are being built. It is, of course, somewhat a compromise, but you can see you can live with a rear headroom. That's okay, also for tall people. And also the trunk area, of course, limit a little bit in height, but still, it's an overall very well usable car, even you know, for a family, so that works. Here, the M50i has a stronger stance on the road, but altogether, this new generation of the X6 is already stronger than before, and this illuminated front kidney, you should check it out in the other episode of the X6, is really very amazing and looks almost a little bit menacing in the front definitely so a little bit stronger in the styling also in general if you compare it to the x5 the interior has been stepped up as for the build quality if you compare it to the predecessor generation so that's a major difference more digitalized yes that's also a main change and you can very well control the car also with the voice input for gps destinations temperature and also whatever you want to hear hear or see so please thank you we're just on camera here. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's always uh, live on tape here on the motor shows. Sometimes, of course, just also funny for you to watch. By the way, I didn't mention that in the interior there will be a head-up display available as we used to from BMW. And at the moment, they're also building among the best head-up displays. So it's also an option that is um, pretty nice to keep your, really, your eyes or your line of sight on the road. Hi, we are live on camera. Thank you. <laughs> so, interior then, great build quality. It's really a pity that they do not offer any sensor tech animal skin alternatives here in the X6. This one so far reserved for the X5. I think that's a wrong decision, definitely. Other than that, they've made a lot of things right with the car. Design is, of course, always a matter of preference. The rear is really, you know, more playful than before, whereas the side profile looks a little bit sleeker than the one of the previous generation. There's definitely a lot of to, to discuss with this car. The PHEV will probably not come with the X6. That one will be reserved for the X5 so far, unless there will be a high demand. The 40i will be a very important engine for the, <laughs> for the uh, X6, especially in the US. And the M50i will surely also be quite important. The normal 50i will be phased out because when people went for the V8, they usually then directly went then for the highest horsepower spec then. So, a lot to talk about with the new X6. Which one would you go for? X5, X6? Or if you compare now the X6 with the GLE Coupe, we can also compare this episode and then would like to have your feedback, feedback GLE Coupe or the X6. Let's discuss this and please continue with the next Outdoor Food episode. Subscribe if you haven't done so far and heads up also to Jonas for camera work, even though we have you know, some disturbances on the motor show as usual. But again, that's live and authentic on Autogefühl. See you in the next episode. What will be the future Mercedes S-Class? Their top of the line, top of luxury car. Well, it will be all electric and will maybe be this EQS concept. Their next all electric vehicle here as a preview for you here on Autogefühl. Let's talk about exterior details and also a little bit about the futuristic interior. Let's go.
In the front we can actually see three new design schemes. First of all, this very round shape. It looks like, like a raindrop, so to say. Of course, this will be really aerodynamic. The second thing is, here those small Mercedes stars, which do not have the ring around the Mercedes stars here in the front grille. And the third is, they play more with the light signature in the front. They actually here have about 1,000 LEDs, 1,000 single LEDs. First of all, those greeting lights here in the front. If this all will be street legal or not, that doesn't play a role at the moment. They first want to show guys what they can actually do. And this EQ mask, all their new EQ models have this special black panel mask. And those ones here are holographic LED lights. So they look a little bit like the normal structure looks at the moment, but it's just, you know, projected into this light. Therefore, it's also flickering at the moment. So very interesting approach right here. And of course, absolutely different to a current Mercedes S-Class. So the design here in the side profile, we can see they called one bow design because there's just one bow across from the front up to the rear. And I think that makes it indeed sensual, beautiful, and also clean from design. And you can see here, light is splitting darkness from light. That was, you know, very legendary, right? <laughs> then also those non-real mirrors. So they are also those camera mirrors, not too keen on this technology, but I mean, concept car. 24 inch wheels, really massive, of course too big actually, and you can see almost no overhang, then a massive long wheelbase to give you all this interior space and use the electric building platform, putting the batteries in the lower end. They say it should have an electric range of about 700 kilometers, that will really be true, I'm not sure, we'll see about that later. And 470 horsepower to give a really boost for 4.5 seconds to 100 kilometers an hour or 62 miles an hour. So, and then this chrome span of the, the top part and really strong shoulders. So, it is not a classic sedan, it is not a van, it's like a low sit. Yeah, what is it? I mean, is it a new segment? So, really interesting. I want to know what you think about this design. And this raindrop design continues here at the rear. Everything is seamless, so to say. And again, those Mercedes stars, the small ones, without the ring around it. Of course, you will still have the classic logo. And it says Vision EQS because this is not the final EQS model. But it will come actually quite soon, the EQS. Just the question is if it will come in that way. It also depends on your feedback. Mercedes will read your feedback and then maybe decide which parts of the cars they do take in that way and which ones maybe not. In the lower end, you have this somewhat diffuser style. But of course, no fake exhaust tips because this is an all-electric car. And I think it can actually be timeless, the design, because the less design lines you use, the more timeless a car is usually. And the glimpse at the interior, we cannot see it from the interior for real because we cannot open it. But we can always see here the illuminated interior. That looks pretty spectacular. And also how the form is inspired by yards, so by expensive boats. Also some kind of living room atmosphere, floating lines and bright materials and also very sustainable ones. This one here is for Mercedes the pinnacle of luxury and in this segment they will offer an animal free interior. So there is microfiber Dynamica from recycled PET bottles and also the Artico leatherette in a high grade that you cannot distinguish it from anything else. And for example, also the roof liner, which you also cannot see that well here at the moment, fabrics on roof will be from recycled ocean plastics. So doing something for the environment there too. Really cool concept. And this really brings the brand to the future. And even the wood that is being used is homegrown maple tree. So also from sustainable resources, which will be regrown and so on. They really thought about this to make an electric vehicle all sustainable all around and I think that's a very important approach and it's not only that it's for lower end vehicles they really put it here to the top of the line this one is the new electric s-class of the future and this really you know means a lot to me definitely and it will in future then also mean a lot to Mercedes to make it full circle also for a co2 neutral production for example what do you think about this interior please tell me in the comments. So we gave you a quick tour on exterior and interior. It's of course a concept yet, yes, 
But I think it shows where the design is heading, more floating lines, more round structures again. Interiors will be more sustainable and more living room alike, inspired by furniture or also inspired by yards. So more about this experience we have in the interior. And definitely, designers will play more with light, both on the exterior and the interior. On the exterior, there are of course more regulations as for that. They have to you know, bring that through governmental proofs. But definitely light will play a more important role in our everyday car lives. Well, soon I'll tell you more about this car as soon as there is a further development stage. Just keep subscribed here on Autogefühl and we'll keep you updated with the development. And I hope you already enjoyed this first insight. Indoors, strange light, a suited up Thomas. That means it's premiere time on Autogefühl here with the Mercedes GLE Coupe. Different trims. This one here is the strong AMD trim. We'll tell you all about it in exterior and interior and technology. Let's go! In the front, GLE SUV and GLE Coupe are pretty much the same. It always depends on the trim version, on the engine version. So you either, for example, get this diamond pin grille. But here in this 53 AMG version, you have those vertical fins here, definitely stronger and also stronger in the lower areas. Everything looks sportier, especially here with the white color, which has this black contrast. And headlamps always come with LED with every GLE or GLE Coupe. Those ones here are the optional multi-beam LEDs, so they have 650 meters of maximum high beam range. And interesting, those pretty modern daytime running light signatures. So what do you think? The length is at 4 meters 94, 16 foot 2 or 194 inches. That's 4 centimeters longer than the predecessor, but now it gets interesting. 6 centimeters less in wheelbase here with the Coupe than with the GLE SUV. That's pretty unusual because you know, that means higher costs in production. Usually they keep the wheelbase for those two versions. So very interesting. Must have been some engineer who really wanted that, that the GLE Coupe is a little bit more agile. Interesting. Wheels come from 19 to 22 inch. Those ones here are the top 22 inch. Usually the AMG 53 starts with 20 inch as standard and then optional, optional the 22 inch. Pretty massive and here also with the red brake calibers, bigger brakes of course. Then you have the contrasting mirror cap here, this dark or night package they call it, also all blacked out as for the frames. You also got the sidestep here, um, yeah this adds some more of this aggressive look, but here the GLE Coupe is of course all about this roof line. It looks a little bit sleeker than the predecessor ge uh, generation, of course not too different and if you compare it to the GLE SUV of course yeah you will lose some room on the interior you'll see later on how that plays out, but definitely here this line that's what it's all about. I'm not the biggest fan of SUV Coupes, to be honest. Are you? Please tell me in the comments. But I think, again, this new generation is a little bit more elegant, especially than in this area, so um, definitely more likable than before. Here, by the way, also the wheel arches in the vehicle color, especially here then for all those AMG versions. So what's your take on design? And actually, I just met the person who took this decision, Andreas Sugan. He is the chief engineer for the GLE. And just tell me, so why did you go for the shorter wheelbase? Okay, when, you, when we started this platform, the Mercedes-Benz High Architecture, uh, we decided that we want to have really separate car lines. So that means the GLE is a basic version. The GLS is, base, is focused on the comfort and noise, vibration and so on. And the GLE Coupe is a sporty one. So, and to get the sportiness of a car, it is one of the major issues that you have a separate wheelbase because as shorter as that is the basic version to get more for the specific adaption of the suspension system for the drivetrain, for the chassis and so on. But the basic situation is a shortened wheelbase. And that was the reason why we decided focus on this car is sportive, agility, precision, and that's we invest a special wheelbase, a short one. 
I just also talked to your AMG colleagues and they told me they were very happy that you took this decision for them actually also. Um, but I mean, what did account the accounting say? Did you say, oh, that's too expensive, just keep it with the same wheelbase or is that somehow you know, feasible in the production? Well, if you make this decision in a very early phase on a project, it's really feasible also for production because it's still a separate robot, uh, a body in white variety, okay, you know, for the for a coupe. Therefore, there are very, very less uh, number of parts which are different, which give us opportunity to create this car. And if the decision is taken in the beginning of the project, it costs very low money, but they have a huge impact on the drivability of the car at the end. Because if you decided it during the project and you have to redesign your production and so on and all these stuff the body invite then it is very expensive and no one would decide it okay thank you very much for the insight You're welcome. <laughs> in the rear we can see that those tail lamps they are more horizontally drawn it's a contemporary design trend definitely but again i think it looks a little bit less bulky in the rear than the predecessor generation but of course i mean some who don't like the suv copays they always criticize you know this big fat end of the vehicle but then again you know also with the small spoiler here it definitely looks also sportier than the SUV and also with this very very flat window the AMG version gets the badge here then of course more dramatic lower end with this central diffuser and well those exhaustive they looks nice but those ones are again just beauty tips so yes dun, 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 fake exhaust alert on autographer <laughs> so when you look inside then you can see the real ones and while Jonas gives you this 90 degrees straight rear perspective, by the way, please some thumbs up and also comments for cameraman Jonas here. Tremendous job. Let me tell you something about the suspension. You start with a normal steel suspension, then you go on to the Airmatic, the air suspension, and then option in general for the GLE Coupe, also this e-active body control that can also lean inside the corners. Pretty whoa, spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> um, we tested that with the GLE SUV. No, I haven't drunk anything yet today. <laughs> Just a little bit out of balance here on the show. And this one here now, the AMG 53. You cannot get the e-active body control for the AMG version, but you always get the Airmatic air suspension, but then in a special AMG trim, which is stiffer. And in general, all suspension setups are stiffer with the GLE Coupe than they are with the GLE SUV. And an exclusive feature, both for GLE SUV and GLE Coupe, when you have the AMG 53 version, then you get the anti-roll control, the anti-tilt control, that keeps the car more steady, more straight. So yes, the e-active body control is not available for the AMG models, but then you get, you know, this, you know, other technology as a replacement. Again, also that it is sportier and stiffer on the road. So, about the engines, here for the GLE 53, always by the way cool here with this carbon fiber um, stiffness bar. This one here, a three liter six cylinder with 435 horsepower. And the acceleration figure is 5.3 seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. So this one here, the Mercedes AMG GLE 53 Formatic Plus Coupe. That's the official name. And then there's also GLE 450. That's three liter six cylinder, also same engine basically with 367 horsepower, so a little bit less. In the driving wind, we had about 9 liters or 1 kilometers consumption with that, with the SUV. And the diesel side for the Coupe in general, 350D, 3 liter 6 cylinder, 272 horsepower, or the 400D, 3 liter 6 cylinder with 330 horsepower. Yeah, that's the basic engine overview. And this one, of course, the most powerful one so far. But we also, of course, I'll keep you updated with different engine variations that might be coming up later. But what is already clear right now is that the SUV has a wider portfolio of engines and they keep it a little bit more limited with the Coupe because the Coupe is definitely more niche with this car. In the front here, the new GLE Coupe as the non-AMG version. You can see here, this one, for example, is the 400D. This one got the diamond pin grille and then this horizontal fin so it always depends on the version you pick this one here the AMG line therefore it gets exactly this front grille yeah the one from the AMG 53 looks a little bit more menacing but this one I think also quite beautiful then we also got the black card to show you some color variation black indeed is one of the preferred colors for the GLE Coupe it somehow fits you know the whole style of the car yes but I think, you know, especially now in this artificial light, the white was a little bit cooler, wasn't it? Hmm, I'm not so sure. 
what about you? This one here is the 21 inch wheel. So we had the 22 with the 53, this one here 21. Gives a little bit more comfort, but you can also just stick, for example, with a 20 inch that will still look good and give you even more comfort. So you will lose comfort, of course, as always with bigger wheels. This one also with a side step here in black, of course, it's a bigger contrast then. And then again, look at this falling roof line here, which is really a little bit different than here in this black color. It's not the darkest of black. We've seen that one with the special edition of the BMW X6. And yeah, I mean, they came on the market now at the very same time, the new X6 by BMW and also this new GLE Coupe. So of course, if you're more interested in the X6, you will also find it here, find it here on our channel. And this is how it looks like in the rear with a GLE Coupe if you do not have the AMG version. Here is a 400D, for example. Lower part is also separated. You can see here, Manufacturers do that with the Coupe SUVs. They put the number plates in the lower part that looks a little bit more prominent in this area. And in the lower part, then we have different fake exhausts. We still have this diffuser, but we have a, you know, even more fakish exhaust because this one is really nothing. <laughs> want to see the interior? Well, I don't. See ya. Just kidding. Of course, we check out the interior. <laughs> so, door closing sound. Hmm, nice. Then, insert of the doors here with carbon fiber inserts. Optional Burmester sound system delivers really a very nice sound, definitely. Reasonable door pockets here also for bigger bottles. Then here we have an illuminated AMG entry badge. There we go. Also carbon fiber inserts or inlets right here. Then you already get this 2 times 12.3 inch dual uh, widescreen screen. Sporty AMG steering wheel, flat bottom. Then those ACC controls are integrated right there. Then we have those controls we don't like so much, to be honest, with those screens for suspension and here for the driving mode settings. Well, it's easy to select, but quality-wise, they don't resonate the rest of the car always, I think. Then the AMG 53 always comes with sports seats, so with bigger bolstering right there. And usually the standard would be the typical great AMG mix with Dynamica microfiber on the inside, like here, it just looks like this, but all over the seat then. And then the outer then, the Artico leather red, so that's also what we recommend. This one here is an option with special red accentuations and more animal material. But again, you can also go animal free and then, then you also still have the sport here and yet more sustainable seat. This one here just with some Alcantara accentuations. Well, let's take a seat. And, well, it's always hard to control it here. <laughs> I mean, when you are on the inside, those controls here at the inside of the doors are actually quite good, but not for car reviews <laughs> when you're filming from here. So, well, I'm um, 1 meters 86 or 6 foot 1. Yeah, subscribers will know. If you don't know, you haven't subscribed. So please subscribe to this and also to our other channel. Then. Headroom, that still works. Although this is the panoramic roof in here, want more head clearance, then you would just leave out this panoramic roof. But you have a nice, comfortable seating position. You have this, you know, grown SUV feeling. There's not too much different here from the coupe and the SUV. So definitely the GLE is one of the most comfortable SUV on the market at the moment. This is the interior overview. You can see here the 53 model got those red contrast stitches right there. Then we have those four horizontal air outtakes right there. Still this AC unit, nice clicking sound. So you can control it while driving. Then two times 12.3 inch screen. This car is not absolutely properly powered at the moment, therefore we cannot show you everything. But if you're more interested in this screen setup, we also have a GLE full review where we also tested this augmented reality function for the GPS and so on. We will also link that review, they can check it out. But overall, a quite sensual cockpit layout, not too minimalistic. So again, Mercedes 
really wants this design focus and also redundant controls for example you have the touch screen right there so we have touch on the right side left side is not touch but you can also control everything with the with your right thumb that only works when you have the next um, ignition phase by the way activated when you would have the key in the car then you can also control with the right thumb this screen and that screen then with your left thumb um, yeah also key not detected that's that's the reason uh, steering wheel can be controlled electronically by the way up and down and in and out and so on and again those ones here would be powered so with the driving modes for example and on the left side then for the suspension settings then in this middle part we have this slider but a lot of black piano lacquer on that one not too keen on that adaptive cup holders and also reasonable space for example for your smartphone then there's a 12 power supply um, and those front Cup holes can also be, let's say, shut off or out. It's an inter interesting function. Hmm. Can be like, you know, more closed around those those cup holes. Interesting. Well, and the next redundant control is then, is then this middle touchpad where you can also control the infotainment screen. So, But I think the solution is interesting because maybe someone says, I like the touch. I like it, you know, keep my hands in the steering wheel or I like to use the central knob or whatever. And you still have the possibilities. You will have a 3D surround camera, different driving modes. Again, suspension setting is stiffer here in the GL Eco P, and of course, even stiffer in this AMG 53 version. Then, further down the middle console, you also have the air suspension control where you can put the car lower or also higher. It will also lower itself at really high speeds. And there's an exhaust node button, for example, for this exhaust valve. And the split in the middle console, there you have two USB-C chargers. One is then for the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto connection. The other one is just for charging and some more reasonable space inside. So, and some more deals with the infotainment screen. Here, let's take another detailed look at the GPS. So, it always depends a little bit also on the web connection. Um, maybe it could be a little bit fast and more responsive, but it's also, you know, a lot of data that is being pro processed. When you want to enter an address, you have different possibilities. Of course, you can do it here, like, you know, the, the very classic way, like this. Um, so, that would be possible. But you could also write it. So, like here, for example, on the touch screen, when you're, like, seeing you know, Berlin or so. Or you can use the voice input for that. Um, and the voice input also works for different stuff um, when you approach it either with a button on the steering wheel or with, hey Mercedes. How may I help you? What's the weather today? Today it will be rainy in Frankfurt with a low of 10 and a high of 17 degrees. So that's the weather then, also totally that's just you know, acoustically. So interesting, and for example, changing the temperature is also possible. This, everything then with this new MBUX system. Now it gets really exciting, as always with SUV coupés. And yes, the true definition of coupé is not an SUV four-door coupé, but then again you could say coupé just means cut, so everything that is cut can be a coupé. We also have a special episode to that. So, here now the rear, Jones just first shows you it like this, also with those carbon fiber inlets. And then you always see you have a little bit less space than in the SUV, but since this one is also the new generation and is a little bit longer, you have a little bit more space than in the predecessor coupe. That at least, yeah. Same design as in the front, and when I now get inside, which is still quite easy, so not much of a problem here. Well, legroom-wise, although this one here has a shorter wheelbase than the GLE SUV, that's still quite good. So, no problems right here. Um, the thing is, this rear bench that was the same in the SUV version, it falls a little bit backwards. So I'm not too keen on that on long t for the long-term comfort. But again, this you know backwards falling rear bench gives you more legroom and also more headroom. So when I lean backwards, I do still fit in here. I can even put a hand over my head so yeah I mean quite slim as for the ceiling there so I mean for four tall adults is actually no problem in here so um, I think that's good result you of course still have a little bit more headroom than in the SUV but then again why not so you can still use that very well seats will be flipped from here I so fix at the outside for the child seats and then we go here with this middle armrest with integrated cup holders, also adaptive. 
Then we have a middle console when it would, would be powered properly. Then you can also have the climate control here and the lower part. Well, this is just, you know, a cubby hole here, but there should be some USB loaders here, actually. I've seen them earlier, but maybe that's not just a pro prototype car. I don't know. Um, well, here in the middle seat, it's actually quite soft to sit, so... And it even works headroom-wise, so... Actually, quite cozy middle seat here, so... I think this car here is still, although it's this coupe shape, still five adult, five tall adult proof, I have to say. And from here you can also take another look here through this panoramic roof. Yeah, I mean, it's quite fancy, but of course, if you live in a very hot climate, then of course it might make sense just to go with a normal closed roof. Well, what about this trunk capacity here? We flip this VW, uh, Mercedes logo, and then the trunk opens. Small step right here, then you have some space underneath. Also option for a replacement tire. Well, of course, you are limited in the trunk height right here, just in the ending. This is the, the big difference to the Geely SUV. Oh, you can also lower the car a little bit when you have the air suspension, like here in the 53 model. And then there's this top cover, which is a manual control, and it folds like this. Yeah. I'm not sure what to think about it. You can also just like pull it and then remove it completely. That will also be possible. But you know, hmm. Not sure what I was sure to think about it yet. What do you think? Well, and the leader figures here, they are a little bit different to the SUV. So this one here is 655 to 1790, whereas the SUV is 825 to 2055. So you lose about 200 liters each, something about that. But again, you can still live with it. Um, the number difference is not that huge because the leader figures are measured below the top cover. And of course, the biggest thing you do lose is the height overall. So, let's see. So, yeah, about that. Front seat is here a little bit far behind at the moment. Um, we got a small step right here, like a little bit rare, but actually quite okay in length. Mm, car's a little bit shorter, yes, but I think overall still very well usable, or what do you think? You close the electric hatch right here, and then child safety test. Ah, well done Mercedes. Actually, Mercedes has managed that one the best. It's the best. <laughs> Amazing. Because other manufacturers, they just apply too much torque, and that can really, you know, squish children, for example. But Mercedes really, uh, I think, I began testing it with the new Mercedes E-Class estate and they are always so sensitive with the torque yet again there has never been any failure when closing the hatch so obviously Mercedes builds the safest hatches. Now to this interior here to show you some more variations this is like a black and white scheme interior it's a couple of thousand euros extra trim here with this leatherette at the inside of the door soft touch and so on that's cool and again there's option of Boymaster sound system but those seats here also in the white black trim, whereas in the A-Class platform cars like GLA, GLB, A-Class and so on, this trim here in the black and white is also available with Artico MBTEX Leather Red. This one here is the animal skin spec. But also for the GLE, they offer more sustainable materials. A lot of different Artico MBTEX choices, so the Leather Red choices, in different colors actually. So plenty of different colors available here for the GLE, even though if you're not interested in the animal spec so really cool what Mercedes is here is offering so far and the IA Motor Show also shows some future sustainable developments also in other cars to coming up in our coverage but color wise definitely very interesting as well and here also with those decor elements in brushed aluminum that also looks quite modern and to me always good to see some alternatives to this black piano lacquer you can also test it, the seat right here I mean, it's quite similar in the other seat we had. Let's push it a little bit down. It's also the same panoramic roof. It's also not properly powered. That's sometimes the problem here with the um, show cars and so on. So, yeah, it's the same as in the other car before. Just again, that you have some other color variation. And also one more look here to the rear. Of course, when there's a lot of black on the interior, it also looks like a dark hole, especially here in this coupe style form. At least there's some white. Again, the styling-wise, I think it's uh, pretty interesting. No perforated seats in the rear here. 
And again, if you think about the smaller platform cars, you can get the same style also with the, with the Artico. You should check out the prices or the configurator in your market, what offers there are actually. So it sometimes depends on the market, which colors and which trim you can get actually. In Germany, there's usually a lot of choices. Then in the US, they're a little bit limited. But again, Mercedes is a manufacturer which offers a lot of different choices, even though if you, you know, go for the smaller platform cars or so. Yeah, that's also the premium price you pay. It's the thing that can individualize also a little bit more. Well, when the first SUV coupes came on the market, I was thinking like, what? Why? And that's really ugly. But now, like the second generations of those SUV coupes, I think are a little bit more likable. They're a little bit sleeker from design. The designers really try to improve this line. And yeah, of course, the SUV versions always make more sense if you think about, you know, practicability. But then again, an SUV coupe, as for the practicability, still makes more sense as the sedan version, for example, of a, of a vehicle that would be the same length. So we've seen also in the trunk that you can still very well use that one. Yeah, so I think it's just up to you and let's say, you know, traffic size or consumption wise, it doesn't really matter if you take the SUV or the coupe. As I like to transport some bicycles also in the rear, I would still go with the SUV. What about you? Would you take this one here, the GLE, also as a coupe? Here, of course, it also depends on driving because of the shorter wheelbase. Will it be that more agile than the SUV? Of course, we will find out here on Autogefühl in our driving review, which will come up at the later stage. Or if you watch this video at the later stage after the premiere, maybe the driving review is already online and it's always worth to browse our channel or use the YouTube search Autogefühl Mercedes GLE, for example, then you'll find all the content. So exterior-wise, pretty strong in the front, definitely. This line, a little bit more, uh, more elegant than before and also stronger stance overall. Then in the interior, this new infotainment system, this is definitely the highlight. Also step up build quality if you think about the predecessor generation. What is interesting, by the way, also as for the build quality, yes, you maybe heard it for the GLE in general, for the SUV mainly, there were some quality issues, especially with some materials that were actually bought from suppliers and um, there were obviously some wrong decisions in the management to maybe, save costs and so on and, but now they are then in germany and they're getting reworked those cars that were originally built in the us so they can actually maintain the quality and then they promise that they are at the quality as they should be yeah that's something that costs um, a lot of money but i think it's also good and transparent choice to tell the customers and then also to rework the cars if there is something wrong when the GLE Coupe is being bu um, built, that's supposed to be changed already. You know, this one here, GLE Coupe and also the GLZ, GLE SUVs, those are actually American Mercedes from the US plant. Then, drivetrain-wise, we also showed you some variation here today. For example, with the 403, we also explained all the engines in the part with the 53 version. This one, of course, will be really powerful. A PHEV is also announced for the Coupe even. But we'll first show you a PF version with a GLE SUV. But again, still think that the GLE SUV will offer a little bit more flexibility also as for the drivetrains. This one also only with the stronger engines, not with a very, very low entry version. But I think you can understand it because a coupe SUV will always remain somewhat in a niche. And of course, the big question here too. Would you take here the GLE coupe or would you go for the X6, the new generation for, from BMW? Also check out those videos and also let's discuss this in the comments. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please subscribe if you haven't done so far and see you at more IAA Motor Show episodes or of course at our driving parts. Thank you. Recently we've shown you here this new Mercedes GLV, the new family SUV by Mercedes. So a lot of space on the interior, but based on the A-Class platform, so to say, the A-Class long wheelbase platform from the A-Class that is sold in China. So very interesting vehicle, but now there's a performance version, the Mercedes GLB 35 AMG. Hmm, does that work and how does it work visually and also performance-wise? Let's find out together here in Autogefühl, exterior and interior from this first premiere. Soon we'll drive it, but now let's dig deeper. Let's go.
in the front, although it's a family SUV, the GLB already has a strong look and especially here in the AMG version, those vertical fins here in the front grille looks really menacing and especially in the lower end here with the contrasting silver. Headlamps start with halogen, then optional you can get LED and optional, optional the multi-beam LED also with an extended high beam function that you also see here. Also a nice racing red tone, so overall I think from the front it already works as an AMG version. Oh, what's your take on that? 4 meters 63, 15 foot 2 or 182 inches is the length of Mercedes GLB and that was a little bit strange because everyone was thinking, hey it's between GLA and GLC, but it's not. So it's just slightly shorter than the Mercedes GLC, almost the very same length. Very interesting. And then this one here is the AMG version. 19 to 20 inch wheels and those one I need the biggest one 21 inch and of course car sits a little bit lower usually you get a normal suspension then you can also optionally go for an adaptive suspension and this one here comes with the adaptive suspension but in an AMG, AMG setting which is a little bit stiffer still with those crossover wheel arches and you can see the whole car sits lower and wow I mean I think the GLB is really a very interesting car because you know exterior dimension and interior space you will soon see, see that but then again, to me, it's not the most beautiful of the SUVs. And then as an AMG version, I think in the front it works very well. But here on the side profile, sitting so low, it looks a little bit, you know, like aftermarket-ish. I don't know. What's your take on that? Not too keen on that on the very first look. Maybe I'm getting used to it. But so far, hmm. And now to the rear. And I think here again, it works somehow to have a more aggressive styling pretty much straight hatch alike. Then we have the silver contrast right here, modern tail lamps. Yeah, I mean, why not? And then the lower part, of course, a little bit stronger. And those ones are pure beauty tips. Der, der, fake exhaust alert again. So the real exhaust are, well, you can see them through that one in the inside. And then the strong diffuser. But again, front and rear works pretty well also as the AMG version. AMG GLB 35 format. Yeah, formatic of course stands for the all-wheel drive. Here, since this one is the front-wheel driven platform, it's front plus rear on demand. So what do we have here? Usual for the GLB, two liter four-cylinder engines, both diesel and petrol aside, so different choices there. And this one here is also two liter four-cylinder turbo petrol engine, in this case 306 horsepower. We also know that from the A-Class 35. 5.2 seconds is the acceleration figure to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. Yeah, pretty strong for such a car. Also with this AMG design here. Of course, this one is not this concept, one man, one engine. It's more stock engine-like, but definitely AMG power tuned. And again, all-wheel drive front plus rear on demand. Maximum distribution is 50-50, actually. So will this work in this very car? I'm you know, really anxious to see that. We will drive that one also very soon. Really looking forward to that. And of course, if it will sell, are people actually are interested to have this kind of engine in this kind of car? Would really be interested in your comments. Please leave them below. Let's discuss this. And now to the interior, which is the special thing about this car. First of all, door closing sound. That sounds very solid and they use a lot of insulation materials all around and therefore one problem of the A-Class platform all around. A-Class, B-Class, A-Class sedan, CLA, GLB, so all, ever, all of this front driven platform. They have a problem here with the doors. I mean, again, I think it's also a problem with insulation. If you don't slam them, it always stays like this, you know? So here on the show, when there's motor show, you always see open doors with A-Class, B-Class, GLB and so on. You really have to slam them really hard, then they close properly. So also an important hint when you buy such a vehicle yourself. Then interior, they can use nice leather red here in different colors available. It looks like animal skin, but it's not. Then also here at the inside doors, you control the seats. 
also galvanized handles and so on. A lot of space at the inside of the door. And then, as this one is the AMG version, you have an AMG entry patch right there. You also have, as from bigger AMGs, this flat bottom steering wheel. Then with those driving mode selector on the right side, this will be illuminated. Left side for the suspension. Right side, you pick up the phone, voice control, and the thumb control. Left side for the ACC. Then also soft touch at the top of the dashboard. Then there's this dual screen setup. Soon more to that when we talk about the um, all interior from the other perspective. Those ones here are animal skin seats as far as my research goes. But the GLB does offer a lot of choices, different colors of Artico or MBTEX leather red. And we've shown you also in the other review where you won't believe it's um, non-animal based, really high quality also available. And also for the AMG would be standard Dynamica microfiber on the inside and Artico or MBTEX leather red on the outside. This is also a very recommended choice and you don't have to pay anything extra then because the GLB here as the AMG will be very expensive. That's a problem because otherwise the GLB is a very attractive offer. Um, for example, the German entry price is below 40k, so like I think 30, 35, 30, 34 or something. So yes, the good thing is it's almost the same length as the GLC, but it's definitely way cheaper than the GLC. So that could be one of the main reasons to go for the GLB. Here, the smooth process here with the steering wheel can be adjusted. And the cool thing is you have so much space here. It reminds me a little bit of the GLK, which I really like, the predecessor actually of the GLC, but in a way this one is also a successor of a GLK because it also has this upright off-roadish building form. And this is a panoramic roof in here. Still I have enough headroom with 1 meters 86 or 6 foot 1. This one is also primary roof. The car is not powered, but this can also be opened. And you got a nice upright seating position here, more comfortable in other than other A-class platform cars. So that's also again an advantage for the GLB. Yes, it's maybe not the most beautiful from the side profile, but it surely gets beautiful from the comfort when you sit in here. Interior overview, yeah, it's basic A-class platform, so we can also see it on the interior. Just this one is new, this cylindric form as an additional decor element, and then those spectacular round vents. Also with nice clicking sounds. And the base would be 7-inch screens left and right, and then optional both sides you can upgrade to 10.25-inch, as you see it now, and then it forms also this two horizontal units. So left side you control with the left thumb usually, then the digital instruments. Car not properly powered at the moment, then we will also have some interior screens right there. And then the right side you can use via touch. It also has this new MBUX system where I have this Hey Mercedes voice activation. Drive me to Berlin. Not sure. Please start, drive me to Berlin. Not sure if it's working at the moment. Let's see. So you can have... Drive me to Berlin. Uh -huh. And yes, I'm holding the microphone there because there's a speaker right there. So you see, now um, we're driving to Berlin and it also works with temperature or maybe opening or closing the uh, panoramic roof. So um, this is pretty cool, this new MAX voice input, one of the best on the market together with the new system by BMW. But again, you can also control the infotainment system here with your right thumb, that's possible. And then if we go a little bit lower down, you also have this touchpad here where you can um, control the infotainment system as well. So that is all possible. And an outer Apple CarPlay connection with cable. Then you can slide open this unit in the front. You have an inductive charging pad together with one USB-C device where you can connect your smartphone then for the smartphone mirroring. We have some adaptive cup holders there right in the front. And then driving modes here in this middle part as well. This is just to put your hand on there. There will be also a special AMG driving mode with you know a little bit less control of the electronic stability control and so on. Oh by the way, did didn't forget here the climate unit. Again, my favorite one of my favorite clicking sounds, together with the old ACs by Audi when there were still those knobs. Um, then the middle, this is always a problem, they are not that aligned right there. I'm not sure if you can pick it up on camera, Jonas. Um, so this is, I think, general problem here. I mean, it's an expensive premium car, so they should make that a little bit better, I think. And then the last thing in the middle console is when we open this middle armrest and we have this open in a split way and then there are two more USB-C 
charging device. So they set all says on the USB-C now. Yeah, some still need adapters for that or, spell, or you know, you can get new cables even for the iPhone like USB-C 2 Lightning or something. So the good thing is both, either way, you put it like up or down, it doesn't have a direction, you know, the cable always fits. That's the good thing with USB-C even though I don't have direct USB-C devices myself yet. So I would like to know from you guys what you think about this interior if you take another complete perspective right there. Also for example with soft touch here on the dashboard. So actually quite well processed. It looks like a high class um, premium car already although it's you know just a GLB. But then again AMG version will already be expensive. One thing though this one here, not sure if you can now see Jonas or you can see me <laughs> or other journalists waiting outside. Sorry guys, we are in depth here. Then this one here, this is a little bit cheap, you know, just this plastic, could be a frameless one. Again, the AMG version will probably be like 60k or something in price. And then you can also have a more high class back mirror. Now to the rear, you can see, first of all, same styling as in the front. And then the rear bench can be slid forward and backward and I put one third backward and the other third forward and you can see the massive difference so you can really put the trunk longer if you want or you can increase the leg room to the max so very flexible and with those handles here you can also flip the back part or just vary it while seating sitting there um, i will first test the rear bench here for you because i mean when you buy this one as an amg version yes you want to have some fun but you still primarily maybe buy it for the family or something so all the way back or like this all the way forward and when you have it all the way back massive amounts of leg room that's pretty cool really amazing that's the big advantage of this vehicle and then you can put it all the way back like this or a little bit more upright just you know as you like it and it's a very comfortable car in the rear it it's actually one of the mercedes that makes most sense Headroom does work here, even though when you don't have the panoramic roof, you'll be a little bit more flexible with the headroom. And you can also sit in the middle part here, it's a little bit harder, but still, it works also with five, uh, yeah, five, one, two, three, yeah, <laughs> five tall adults. It's sometimes a little bit hard on the brain when you hear on the motor shows, like a thousand people running around and everything is hectic and stuff, and then you have to cancel some of the shots you do meanwhile and five people walk through the lens. So what Jonas and I here, our team for the IA Motor Show, we always try to keep it calm and collected. <laughs> then here's some cup holders inbuilt right there, like this. Isofix, of course, at the outside seats. Even this middle part, you can just control individually. Well, in the front, there's really enough space then and then there are some two USB-C devices or chargers in the top bar and you just feel so much at home when sitting here in the rear compartment. Also with a split panoramic roof, you can also use the shades when it's maybe too hot. Well, and then of course, what about getting to those sixth and seventh seats? This is of course really interesting. You do not have to get them if you want a rather clear trunk, so to say. You can also go with the five-seater version, but you can also go for the seven-seater version Hmm, does it make sense? I mean, not too sure about that, but maybe you are seeking a seven-seater and then you can get one from Mercedes now, one that you can actually... Well, Mercedes is always expensive, yes, as a premium vehicle, but this one, of course, less expensive than most of the other ones. Jones takes the first shot and then you can see you can get in there and those are the six and the seventh seat there. And it really depends on also how is the front bench organized and let me check it out. So when I get, now it's Thomas workout starting, always when they're five or seven seaters. So I could still sit the way uh, like this. Then I go around. So come on guys, this gets really exciting now. Yes, <laughs> getting here. Oh, the suit doesn't like that that much. My tailor will be watching this and saying like, Thomas, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> so, so let's say, um, well, first of all here, sitting here. Oh, by the way, this is here, you know, life and auto fuel, this plastic cover. This was hopefully going off, but you can just push it on again. Just that we're showing it, it's everything is authentic here. Well, pushing up the head restraint. I can sit here, although it's a little bit cramped. I do exactly fit, yeah, I put my head a little bit back. I do hit the ceiling, but I mean, it could work for shorter routes, could theoretically. Let's see. Um, 
now I would be in the seat where I could still sit in front of that and it could directly work. So, um, I mean, it's not a super long car, but it is somewhat astonishing that it still could work. We had other bigger seven seaters where we had basically the same result, you know. So, um, of course, it's not meant to be driven with seven tall adults. But, you know, if not everyone is like very tall in the front, that still works. What is cool that they thought about isofix in the rear seats here. So if you have, let's say, five small children with, let's say, with four child seats, which you can put in here on the rear seats, that could then work. So you are definitely more flexible thinking about the next soccer game, for example. So what about the trunk area here, electric hatch we got. And then this is a setup as a six and seven seat would still be up. So just, you know, minor space left, some cubby hole underneath. But then, oh, that's the other way, yeah, like this. This is a nice solution here, the red handles and then they flip automatically like this. So um, if you have the five-seater, there would be still some storage underneath here. You can check that out in our other review episode. We already have from GB. Oh, USB-C device chargers also in the two actually in the rear for the six and seven seat. Nice that I thought of that. So, and then we'll flip this one here again, like this, and go the other way around. And then, wow, I mean, this is pretty cool. And those square dimensions really help you. Thinking about putting mountain bikes inside, just remove the front wheels, put a blanket over that, and then there we go. And that's also reason, I mean, you can do a lot of things with that car. And that is really massive. So for this one here, big thumbs up. And now to a conclusion for today with the Mercedes AMG GLB 35. Yeah, not 53. That would be probably a little bit too strong for this car. <laughs> well, but what's your take on that? A performance version of this family SUV? You could say, why not? Why not having fun and still offering a lot of flexibility? Because the ratio of exterior space and then what space you have on the interior is really good. And therefore, I also really like this vehicle. Yeah, it's not my favorite as for design from the side, but I really like in the front and also in the rear. Just the side profile, especially in the AMG version. I don't know, maybe it will grow on me, but so far, first look, I'm not too excited about it. But driving-wise, it will probably be sc scoring quite well. It has a longer wheelbase than a normal A-Class, yes. But then again, it's still not such a long car. It's also pretty light, so this can actually qu work quite well, also performance-wise. We're looking forward to test that one. The interior is really a great thing. It has a good build quality. They have great animal skin alternatives, which are really high class. So, and even seven seater option in an AMG vehicle. I haven't seen that yet. Now it's there. What do you think, guys? Hope you're also tuning in to other episodes here from the IAA Motor Show. And of course, also, if you haven't seen the initial episode we've uh, done with the GLB with a non-AMG version, you should definitely check that out. We always link interesting videos which are related to the current video in the video description and also in the pinned comment. Thank you. Do you remember the Ford Puma that was built from 1997 to 2001 as a small sporty coupe on the Fiesta platform? Well, that one is surely gone. But now the Ford Puma is back. But this time, rather as a crossover, as a small SUV, still on the Ford Fiesta platform, but definitely a little bit different than before. Exterior and interior tour, as you know it here on Auto Fuel. Let's go! In the front we can see a Fiesta resemblance, yes, but it's put a little bit higher in this crossover style. And what a beautiful Thomas Blue color here. My favorite color, definitely. That's why we call it Thomas Blue in Auto Gefühl. By the way, always subscribe to our channel here if you haven't done so far, then you can join us for the newest reviews. This one is the ST line. There we have a sport air style here with this black front grille and also stronger lower bumper. So the ST line definitely fits that one very well. So then it comes a little bit closer to the initial old um, Ford Puma. We also love their definite design wise. It was also a small design icon. 
The length is 4 meters 19, 13 foot 7 or 165 inches. And the interesting thing is, it is about 18 centimeters longer than a smaller Ford EcoSport and 33 centimeters shorter than the bigger Ford Cougar. So the Puma is indeed in between the EcoSport and the Cougar. So why not? I think that's also a wise decision. As I said, on the Fiesta platform, this ST line here, also is a batch right there, sporty style with a lower bumper. This one also gets a sport suspension. You can also get a base suspension, of course, SD line then with a sport suspension. If that one can be recommended, we have to wait for the driving review to tell you more about that. Biggest wheels here available are 19 inch, also equipped with that car, and that of course looks pretty massive. Then those painted wheel arches in the ST line, the normal look would be the crossover wheel arches in plastic. Then this coupe style somewhat right there. Also quite strong shoulders, so indeed it's very interesting from design and this new bow that goes right here, round design lines right there. Overall pretty likable from the design and the tail lamps always start way in the side profile. The only thing I don't like right here, you know, are those rubber covers here at the lower doors at the you know at the sills here so um, this could be a little bit higher as for the build quality other than that especially in this color lovely Ford also went a little bit more daring at the rear here with those three-dimensional tail lamps also with this transparent glass cover that looks pretty fancy big Puma logo then the ST line again with the sportier lower bumper and Glad they did not go for any fake exhaust. Ford calls this honest design and we can agree to that. So this is also on the other side, uh, you know, pretty nicely covered real exhaust tip. So under the hood we have a 1 liter 3 cylinder turbo petrol engine with 125 or with 155 horsepower. And then, as we see it right here, with a mild hybrid concept. So we can have, you know, at some recuperation at some point and also sailing or coasting function with a very, very small battery. Interesting that they also now go the M halfway. Alternatively, there would be a 1.5 liter diesel also with 125 horsepower. So small engines, not too much choice, but again, they try to keep the price also low. And again, since it is on the Fiesta platform, they of course share a lot of the technologies. to the interior, pretty thick door handles, also with keyless entry function, door closing sound. Yeah, it sounds quite okay. Then, inside of the doors, this one, the ST line with sporty red contour stitches right there, that's a leather red cover, soft at the inside of the doors. Hardback is just right here, there of course they try to save some money. Very shallow, this inside door um, pockets here, so I'm not sure if that holds a lot. Also thin materials. ST line badge to give it a little bit more spice, definitely, and also those are support seats, you see with fabric on the inside, and I guess that should be leather red on the outside, yeah. Maybe some animals, I think they split sometimes animal skin and leather red parts, but you cannot really differentiate what's what. But the majority is definitely fabric. Interesting design idea. And then also with the red contrast stitches. Again, the base seat would be having a little less shoulder support. Then also red contrast stitches at the inside of the steering wheel, flat bottom, sporty style, perforated sides. Then also red accentuations at the inside of the air vents. So a lovely structure. Then this has this carbon fiber style. Of course, it's not real carbon fiber, it's a style. And the soft touch on the top dashboard, that is also guaranteed in this case. So good that I thought of that. Aluminum pedals we also have. Yeah, that's of course what you need to have with the Sportier ST line. Now the question is when I get inside, this is still a small car. And first seating test is, well, I have to say, it is somewhat, you know, somewhat like in Ford Fiesta, there you feel the platform difference. You sit a little bit higher, yes, so that's good that you sit a little bit more upright. This will give you a little bit more comfort. We have the seat all the way low. The headroom I have is, well, it gets really close. I do exactly fit in here with 1 meters 86 or 6 foot 1, but again, that comes quite close, especially with this panoramic roof. So, let's see, we can also close this shade manually. And you can also slide it open, this panoramic roof, but it's not properly powered here at the moment. Well, but first of all, interesting, um, you know, first impression. 
maybe it's not the most comfortable car. We also know that from a Fiesta. If you're a tall person, if you're a little bit smaller, then you won't have a problem. But if you're a little bit taller, you know, as I am, um, then maybe, you know, in the long run, I don't know. But at least you sit a little bit more upright than the Fiesta. That could also be a first advantage here for the Puma. So, interior overview, you can also move that steering wheel up and down and in and out. And then you see those new 12.3 inch digital instruments. Unfortunately, the car is not properly powered at the moment. There we can show you too much of that. Um, maybe we open and close the door and maybe sometimes we can see, yeah, there it is, there's a visualization of the 12.3 inch. Oh, with a Puma, that's nicely done with that logo there. Brings some more emotional touch to this car. Why not? <laughs> Pretty interesting. Then this central screen there in the middle part. This, you know, is a little bit attached off there, but that's the way that you can easier control it here. Also, maybe you know, do something while driving. And um, their new systems are actually quite good. There are better ones, yes, but they do the job definitely. Phone connection either via Bluetooth or there's also now on the mobile apps. You can actually also use Apple CarPlay or uh, the Android Auto. But so far we cannot use um, the car internal map when we have Apple CarPlay or Android Auto connected. Volume knob here with some cheap rubber around, so they have to increase the build quality there a little bit. This one, of course, all Fiesta style, also with lower down a little bit with the climate unit. And again, the build quality here is not as I you know, would like to see it, but again, it also keeps being a budget car, so you have to make some compromises. In the front, there's an open space also for your smartphone with an inductive charging pad, for example. 12 volt power supply next to USB supply for connecting your smartphone. And then there's here in this case a six speed manual gearbox. If we go further down, there's a manual handbrake. Yes, I always need that when I'm, you know, driving with Cam Block together and we're doing our drifts. And then there are some cup holders. They are also somewhat adaptive and also have a little illumination. And last but not least, there's a small armrest, but this the whole middle console is also pretty loosely attached. And then there's some space underneath and another USB supply. Now what about the rear? When I'm sitting in the front, first of all, look, same ST styling than the front. This one, of course, they're now all hardback. And here the materials are rather simple with those Ford interiors. Interiors not really where Ford is leading. Definitely have to admit that. Then the rest styling also with those red contrast stitches. Well, you see, it looks a little bit more upright than in the Fiesta. But what about the space I really have when taking a seat behind me as I would be driving? Again, it's not a long car. The package is not too bad. I mean, 4 meters 19, but when you think about, for example, the Honda E, <laughs> yeah, we've just been sitting in that one, that was a better package. So I, he, I hit um, the back seat here with my knees, so cannot sit here with four tall adults after each other. Headroom, it does exactly fit, but I'm inside this rear panoramic roof, which you can also open and close with this shade, uh, very interesting. So yeah, a little bit cramped in here, not too different than the one from the Fiesta. Then you just need a bigger car or one with a better package. Um, yeah, that's just how it is. So the seating position itself, if you have shorter legs, it's actually quite comfortable. That's good because it's also upright, but then again, not much space for your for legs. But when we think about some of longer cars, they are not better in the package. Isofix at the outside here for installing child seats. And then we flip the seats already from here, and that works in a two-third, one-third split. Of course, we'll soon also take a look at the truck. Let's open it right here with this hatch. And, wow, what's that? <laughs> Interesting. Plant transport, and that would be, you know, one thing you can do with this so-called mega box. This is very interesting. So this uh, um, actually for something that can get wet. So I just put out the plant, you know, for a second. But that could be used for plant transport indeed. And if you remove this cover here, you can even use this lower screw here and open it. And then the water rinses actually through to the... I mean, I can't believe that. Is that really true? Um, let's see. I mean, it's... Yeah. I can't believe it, it's really going through, like this. <laughs> That's really funny. So, pretty amazing system. I haven't seen that. Maybe, yeah, the, the Jeep Wrangler does offer something of function, but not, not in the trunk. So, pretty interesting, new use case. I mean, why not trying something different? The normal trunk, of course, is like here. This one would be the cover, and then you can have it more even, like this. Then you can also flip the seats from here, move them over. And this is also interesting solution here that the top cover right there is placed 
on the top part of the windshield. It's an interesting system how it is attached, but the good thing is that when you open it, you have direct open access right here, as you've shown it, for example, for flipping the seats. And when you close the trunk then again, then you see it does stay on the top and also shuts off that you, you know, have, don't have any, like, any, oh, what's in there? But also in the SD line here, the window is a little bit darker. That also seals off from views. And as an alternative, we always love to show you different variations of a car. This one here is not on the ST line anymore. This one is called Titanium X. You can see this one also has those crossover wheel arches, so not painted in the wheel color. Also a different color here, but that one you can pick freely, definitely. So which style would you actually prefer? This one here or the rather sporty ST line? You can see also the front grille is a little bit different. Also the lower bumper is not as sporty, but definitely also somewhat distinctive. This you also equipped then again with the MF system. And have you seen again this LED structure in the front headlamps? Also very interesting. So it's not, you know, let's say, clean, but definitely unique the styling they found there with the front headlamps. And the three quarter rear perspective, also very interesting. Those ones here, by the way, are 18 inch wheels, so a little bit smaller than we've seen with the ST line but still both quite big for such a small vehicle. You can also get smaller ones if comfort is more important to you. This one then also fitted with the normal suspension. So what's your take here on the exterior design? Please discuss it in the comments. And different interior, this one then without the SD line, titanium and nice fabric seat covers there with a gray style. Also the seats are a little bit more open so they probably deliver you a little bit more comfort than two. And those zippers, have you seen those all around the vehicle in the front surface here of the seats and indeed I do prefer the comfort of those seats they are a little bit more open um, deliver you a little bit more comfort especially because the car is not that large here also again with the bright ceiling that gives more light to the interior and also this bright fabric surface here you know gives you more living room premium atmosphere than the ST line with more leatherette and some parts animal skin use so I think the titanium X here the trim is more premium than the ST line definitely also here then you know with this um, not sure if that's that's real word can't say at the moment but it surely does feel like this so the mat material also you know this is pretty cool as for the material so that definitely adds some more touch to this interior and yeah I mean those zippers here this is a pretty interesting idea to do it like this so um, you know when there are then some stains on those beautiful fabric seats at least you have the possibility to do something against it a little bit easier and now to our conclusion for today with the Ford Puma well this new edition of that one I mean why not making it a little bit more cross crossover -ish, SUV ish that's the contemporary trend and you know why not doing it in that way Definitely looks stylish and emotion from the exterior. Interior, I really like the Titanium X trim here today with those bright fabric seats, which also can be bought then with those removable seat covers. So that was pretty cool. Other than that, the interior is somewhat a weak part of this car. You don't have too much space, but then also it's, it's a small car. And of course, those fabrics are pretty, pretty cool at the inside of the doors. But then there are also some weak parts we found there, like with those rubber claddings and so on. Interesting also with the trunk with this new mega box. So I mean not sure what I would use it actually for But it's a definitely very interesting approach also with those mild hybrid engines by the way The MHF function is not only available for the bigger petrol engine But also for the smaller horsepower auto version forgot to mention that earlier. So both actually available with the MHF Let's see how that one plays out if it will be lower in consumption because early tests with the Fiesta for example usually we were, were quite high in the fuel consumption. Maybe the MHF can be a solution for that. Like to you know what do you think about the new Ford Puma here? You like it here when it's a little bit crossover SUV -ish? if you of course can remember the old Puma as a comparison. So thanks for tuning into that one here and also tune in to the next episodes.